Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. And I dare even say a special edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. It is Sunday, August 29th, 2021. And as you can visibly see for those joining us visually on either YouTube or Facebook, I am joined by my dear friend and colleague, Kyle Ashworth. Hey, Kyle, how's it going? It's well, thanks, John. Uh Good to have you here. It is. It's good to have you here because <laughs> we are broadcasting on both platforms, both the Latter Gay Stories podcast and Mormon Stories, which is unique and it's exciting. It's amazing. Yeah, we're making history. So um, we are super excited today. Uh, it has been a busy week in Mormon land because uh, last week, Mormon apostle Jeffrey R. Holland uh, gave a uh, very controversial talk to BYU uh, faculty and staff. Um, and we've covered that already on Mormon Stories Podcast. We had my dear friend Kyle here, along with Gerardo, talking about their reactions as members of the LGBTQ more, kind of Mormon community to that talk. We also had John Larson come on, who um, shared his feelings and thoughts about it. Um, but uh, just to give you guys a quick overview for those who have no idea what I'm talking about, many of you join us as having never been Mormon. Uh, last week, one of the top-ranking Mormon uh, apostles gave a talk at BYU where he basically said several things. He tried to express some empathy for the LGBTQ Mormon experience, um, but then he went on to basically, uh, in my interpretation, call out BYU uh, administration, staff, and faculty expressing concern about the level of support that is being shown to the LGBTQ community and to criticisms made by BYU students, staff, and faculty to the LDS Church and its leadership for um, the church's position opposing uh, same-sex marriage and um, other, other types of uh, policies. Uh, he actually invoked some war-like rhetoric, talking about picking up your muskets, talking about friendly fire, uh, in a way that, uh, especially given kind of the, the larger political environment here in the United States was distressing to many people. And then uh, another thing that Elder Holland did in his talk was he called out um, a, a former uh, Brigham Young University valedictorian named Matt East, Eastman. Oh my gosh, Easton. 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 Matt Easton. I am so bad with names sometimes. Matt Easton. He actually called out Matt Easton, um, who two years ago in his uh, graduation speech as valedictorian of BYU, called him out um, for com for only coming out as a faithful gay Latter-day Saint in his uh, valedictorian speech at BYU when uh, he had vetted that talk with BYU and with the church. But Elder Holland expressed really concerns not only about Matt having done that, but also about um, the, the potential slippery slope of what might happen if if uh, things like that are allowed at BYU commencement addresses. And many of us were just aghast and offended that uh, a man in his level of power, someone who's viewed as a special witness of Christ, as a prophet, seer, and revelator, would not only use invoke war rhetoric, talking about muskets and, and friendly fire um, as a, a witness of Christ, but also in a, a strong position of power, but also someone at that level of power and influence would call out, not by name, but everyone knew who he was talking uh, about, would call out a member of, of his church for something that was approved by BYU. And uh, that person, again, uh, was Matt Easton. And so what we wanted to do is we reached out to Matt, uh, who is at UC Berkeley. He's getting a PhD in political science at UC Berkeley. And we, we uh, reached out to some donors and said, hey guys, if any of you will support Matt, We'd love to fly him here to Salt Lake City, to our studio on holiday over the weekend and interview him to hear his story, to um, talk about the, the speech he gave a couple years ago, what the response was to that, to talk about his time at BYU, his time as a Mormon, but also to talk about his, um, his thoughts and feelings about Elder Holland's talk last week and just to talk about kind of where we are now at BYU, in the church, et cetera. So we flew Matt Easton out. So Matt Easton, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you so much. I, I am so excited to be here. 
And um, obviously, it's, it's great that I got to come see you, but I'm also grateful that I got to come visit my family and get a much needed hug from my mom. So, so thank you for that. And, and to everyone who donated uh, to get me here, it really means a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're just so thrilled. And so many people just want, want to hear from you. Um, <laughs> I think that's the yeah. interesting part as we, as we were pre- kind of show prepping and, and discussing exactly how we uh, approach this topic, I kept thinking, you know, maybe we should have renamed the episode Vindication for a Valedictorian. And then the more I thought of it, that's really not the Matt Easton that I know. It, it isn't that Matt's out here looking for vindication from an apostle. But this is a this is an episode to allow Matt an opportunity to share his experience and share his story and how two years ago a approved under under the under the umbrella of of graduation BYU administration approved a message that was not only affirming but special and and welcoming to that audience and then to have that ironically uh, Elder Holland says commandeered. Um, so, so in essence, Elder Holland commandeers Matt Easton's experience um, by using essentially the valedictorian as a bludgeon against, I think is probably the administration at BYU. So instead of vindication for Matt, I think this is validation of, of a queer person's experience and your experience at BYU and your experience post BYU and where that's taken you. And, and so for the latter gay stories audience, I'm sure uh, where we're uh, primarily a LGBTQ audience, I think that is the message that that audience likely would like to hear as well is uh, where is Matt going and, and from where you came, how has that benefited and, and influenced your experience on where you see uh, Matt a few years from today or even tomorrow? And so, again, we're excited to hear your story as well, and we want to lay out the red carpet. So for those of you who are on the Latter Gay Stories platform, we invite you to send in your questions, your comments. Uh, we do have our interactive uh, system going for both our YouTube and our Facebook channels. So if you send your questions in, we're going to get them. You're, you're live, and so we hope that Matt will answer those as candidly and uh, nicely as possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and Kyle, I just want to – I just. Would you mind just taking a second? We just we just had Kyle Ashworth on Mormon Stories a few weeks ago. It's it's one of the most um, effective, uh, heartfelt, and uh, important interviews I think I've ever done. But for those who just don't know who you are, Kyle, would you mind just introducing yourself and talking just really quickly about Latter Day Latter Gay Stories, just because I think it's it's so important. Yeah, the Latter Gay Stories podcast was originally born right here with the Open Stories Foundation in 2012. It was branded under the uh, Gay Mormon Stories podcast name. And thanks to John and, and your work with the queer community, especially um, in uh, your educational studies and your research studies uh, benefiting the LGBTQ community, from that spawned the Gay Mormon Stories podcast. Uh, over the years, that podcast featured a variety of different stories that were a lifeline to me as a closeted gay, uh, active Latter-day Saint in a mixed orientation marriage. Uh, In 2017, I approached John and the Open Stories Foundation and said, either um, you do something with that podcast or I'm going to compete against you. And John, in his infinite wisdom, said, take it, (laughs) run. And so in 2018, I rebranded the Gay Mormon Stories podcast into the Latter Gay Stories podcast and took it under uh, my own umbrella and and allowed the podcast to go in a direction that was more queer driven, uh, the highlighting the stories of the LGBTQ community without agenda, not that I believe that there was an agenda before, but just allowing the LGBTQ person to, to share their story exactly where they were at today. And because of that, we've been able to create resources that have ministered uh, in a very Mormon way to the LGBTQ community uh, here with, within the Intermountain West, but also beyond. And our listenership has grown exponentially as it um, we share a message not only through uh, the lens of Mormonism, but a lens that also is familiar with the Mormon Stories podcast audience, uh, a lens that is familiar with anyone within a religious society. And, and that really has been the mission. And, and thanks to uh, generous sponsors and donors, they've allowed us to continue to spread and expand our reach uh, to help us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. Yeah. Just, just for those who don't know, like how many hours and or episodes are you up to now on Latter Gay Stories? We, um, we're at 150 episodes. Um, every episode is, is uh, we have a video and audio version of the episode. We also... Um, feature written stories. We have a written coming out story that happens every Sunday. Every Tuesday we have In My Own Words. 
We also have parents and allies who share their written stories uh, and video stories as well. And then we have a very active and vibrant Facebook um, group with about uh, nine or 10,000 people who participate on the Facebook side, a YouTube channel, uh, Instagram, and sometimes we're TikTok friend. I shouldn't say friendly. Some TikTok's been fun. Uh, TikTok's been a great opportunity. And one of the hallmarks at the Latter-day Stories podcast is our On the Record project, which highlights uh, the church, LDS Church's history in messaging and treatment of the LGBTQ community from 1830 all the way to the present. And that is a downloadable resource that has been, uh, it's a way to use Mormonism within Mormonism and essentially putting the church leaders on the record for what they've spoken of regarding this topic. And for me, we're, we're gonna, we plan to do an episode on On the Record, but for me, it's a PDF that's as important as the CES letter. Maybe it's not quite as well known yet, but when you, it's as well done and as important, I think, uh, as the CES letter in terms of understanding Mormonism and its history. So There is no spin to the On the Record. It is just what our church leaders have said on the record concerning this topic. And as you, for many people who say the church will never change, the church isn't changing fast enough, On the Record really is a detailed chronology of where the church has been, uh, where they're at today, and potentially where they're going, essentially based on a chronological look of, at how they've treated this topic. So it isn't spin, it isn't a hit piece, it is just what has been spoken the on the record. Yeah. Mixed in with some leaked videos and some audio and some things that the church leaders probably didn't want you, the general public, to know, that also is on the record. I love it. Well, Ka, thank you so much for coming thank uh, you. on a Sunday. I know you had a lot of stuff going on. I so. know, my second Saturdays have become quite busy <laughs> lately, so <laughs> happy to be here. All right, and, uh, and last but not least, uh, I really want to uh, give a shout out to Kara Burrell. Kara, thanks for joining us. So it's, excited. It's oh, Sunday and it's you, an you had a busy weekend already. Yeah, I just got back from Jesse Funk's uh, amazing uh, event up in Park City, especially for Truth for Women that I spoke at along with a lot of other amazing women and probably had 85 attendees. So I just spent an amazing weekend, drove down from Park City, pretty much patted my kids on the head, said, hi, remember me, I'm your mom, and then came over here. So <laughs> thanks for coming. Yeah, it's, it's I'm so excited for this you. one, though. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dig in, Matt. Um, what, what Kyle and I thought would make sense first was just to do a typical Mormon story, because uh, every story counts, and I think your story is super cool. I don't know if you know this, but I graduated uh, summa cum laude from BYU in political science. No, I did not so know that. We, the I same department. Yeah, I, I wasn't valedictorian, but I, I mean, I was close, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, I did Washington seminar, and yes. so I've got that background. But I'm dying, to, I, I'm dying to hear your story. So if it's okay, before we jump into all the Holland stuff, I just want to kind of do a classic Mormon story. Can we, is that all right? If we that, start that would be awesome. I would love to. Thank all right. You. So Matt, where does your Mormon story begin? Oh, where does my Mormon story begin? Um, well, I... I'm born and raised here in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, Cottonwood Heights, for those who are familiar, um, to a very um, re religious and devout LDS family. Um, both my mother and my father come from, I don't know, seven or eight generations of, of uh, members of the LDS church. Uh, I, my direct descendants were converted by Brigham Young, came across the plains. Um, so it's really uh, a part of my blood and a part of my community and my culture, and, and, and it has been my entire life. Um, I'm the, the third of four children, boy, girl, boy, girl. Uh, I'm number three. And uh, yeah, I was raised uh, what I feel like was probably a pretty typical uh, Mormon experience, going to church every week, uh, family home evening, reading scriptures. Uh, but from a very early age, I knew that I was a little bit different. Uh, for example, I loved playing with Barbies. My older sister and I would play with Barbies. We'd paint our nails with washable markers. Um, just, just sort of stuff that was typically considered, you know, girly. Uh, and, and for the beginning of my life, I think my parents were pretty accepting about that. You know, they just let me and my sister go off and kind of do our thing. Um, but I do remember a point in my life, I think I was eight years old. It was right around when I, uh, got baptized, uh, where I suddenly got a lot of signals that that was no longer okay. Um, where I had to start washing off the nail polish. I, you know, couldn't get Barbies anymore. I remember one Christmas, I uh, uh, came upstairs to open my presents, and instead of the um, you know toys that I wanted, I got a bunch of sports equipment, you know, uh, a set of golf clubs and a tennis racket and a basketball and football, and and I was like, Mom and Dad, I, I hate sports. I don't want any of this. <laughs> um, but it but it sort of signaled to me that it was time for me um, to put away those things that I liked that that weren't appropriate, 
and uh, really built some shame inside of me where I, I knew, even though my parents didn't tell me directly, I got this message that there were parts of me that weren't okay and that I needed to hide. Um, so, so that's what I did. I, I think uh, from what I understand, a, lo a lot of queer people uh, have a similar experience to me. And um, I think I realized I was gay, gosh, when I was a, a child. I mean, I had a crush on the Red Power Ranger. Uh, I loved Eric from The Little Mermaid. Why the red one? Why the red one? I don't know. He's just kind of, he's. That's such a straight question from a man to ask. I get you. <laughs> thank you. Why thank the you, red one? John, please. Yes. Thank Continue, you. Matt. <laughs> um, uh, where was I? Is so it, is it obviously the red one, at Kyle. Is it, am I missing something? I never got into the power. My brothers were into Power Rangers, but How when you talk you, about way, Ariel, Matt? yeah, and Eric <laughs> and Eric. King Triton, that was my jam. Like yes. that, yeah. that is my era. Yeah, um, I am. Right. I'm 26 years old. I was born okay. in 1995. Okay. Um, uh, anyway, Red Power Ranger. Sorry. <laughs> Red Power Ranger. Yes. Uh, and so I, I think I knew I was gay um, as early as I can remember. Ever since I had a crush on Prince Eric, right and. And um, I remember growing up, my favorite color was rainbow. And one day, my older brother, he mm. told me, Matt, you know rainbow? You can't like rainbow. That's gay. Mm. And I'm like, what is gay? Mm. And so I, I remember asking my parents. Um, Andy said that it, you know, rainbows are gay. What does that mean? Uh, and my, my parents, uh, you know, I don't blame them. I don't think they really knew how to handle that situation. But they just sort of said... Oh, gay just means it just describes people who don't support the church, oh. you know, and it's something that we oh. just kind of avoid. Yeah. Um, and so I, I didn't really understand that gay meant boys like boys, girls like girls, but I, I understood that gay was not okay. But can, I, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, for sure. So in terms of kind of the Mormon upbringing, like scripture study, family home evening, gospel principles taught in the home, how, to what extent was your kind of family, the, the context of your Mormon upbringing really orthodox versus yeah. versus not? Um, I would say we're like pretty traditional. Um, you know, when I've talked with some of my friends or people I met at BYU, we're not as orthodox as uh, uh, other families. Like we were allowed to watch movies on Sundays, but we couldn't go shopping, you know, and, and we went to church every week pretty regularly, you know, wore modest clothing. Um, so yeah, we never had any anything with the word of wisdom, no secret coffee in the house or anything. So, um, yeah, like I would say fairly orthodox, uh, pretty traditional. And your parents' beliefs were, looked like what? Their beliefs? Yeah. Um, yeah, they, growing they, up. growing up, yeah. I, I think that they, they really believe in the church. They still do. And, and they did all growing up, uh, taught all of my siblings and I to, to make it one of our biggest priorities, if not the biggest. So Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father and prayer and the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and Joseph and, Smith that yep. was all that was all heavily sort of like focused on in your family. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So then you find out that that you know you can't like rainbows because that's gay yeah. and that being gay means you don't support the church. And exactly. I think this slides into a familiar territory for so many LDS families with LGBTQ kids because typically a topic like this becomes so taboo that we don't talk about it. Yeah. And there, there is no structure in that home. So I'm curious as to how much support uh, or foundation existed in your family structure to allow a discussion about, a real discussion, not just Matt run away from the rainbow, but a real discussion about sexuality and especially a sexuality that wasn't heterosexual. Uh, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, they're really... Uh, hasn't been that kind of structure, definitely not growing up, uh, sort of a don't ask, don't tell policy, you know, mm -hmm. where I, I think that because the answers aren't exactly straightforward, uh, that's kind of scary. At least that's how I interpret it with my with my parents and my siblings. And yeah, so it's something we just didn't talk about, you know, and, and in retrospect, after I've come out, you know, I've, I've received a lot of feedback from my siblings, my family, my cousins, that they're like, yeah, Matt, we knew you were gay, like since, you know, since you were playing with Barbies. Um, but nobody ever ever mentioned or talked to me about it. And looking back, I think maybe it's because they were scared that if they mentioned it, that would like encourage Give me. Give you ideas, right? Exactly. As if it's like something that, that happens when you learn. <laughs> yes. If you learn the wrong things, that makes you gay. When your parents bought you like golf clubs or like sporting equipment, yeah. was that just what they did with everyone? Or did you sense that they might that might have been done out of fear and concern and a desire to help shape what might become your sexuality? Do you do you even know if that was even part of that? 
Yeah, I I mean, I don't know for sure. I haven't asked them directly, uh, but I do know that it was a different treatment than any of my other siblings. Mm. That, that there was a very clear line that they had made where the year previous it was okay and then suddenly it wasn't okay. Mm. Um, and, and none of my siblings, at least as far as I'm aware, had that same experience. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so... Yeah. So, um, so I knew this gay thing means that you like rainbows. And so I'm kind of like, well, I like rainbows. Am I gay? But I love the church, so I can't be gay. And um, It wasn't until sixth grade that I learned what gay was. So I was about 11, 12 years old. Uh, and it's because my class had just gotten laptops in elementary school. And one day, uh, this girl and I in our class, were we used the laptops to Google image search uh, Channing Tatum. Uh, I think she's the man had just come out. So there are all these shirtless pictures of him. And I remember looking at those and I was like, oh my gosh, I really like that. I like looking at this. What does this mean? And the girl next to me was like, oh, don't look at those matter. That means you're gay. And, and she explained to me what gay meant. You know, it means that, that boys like to kiss other boys and same thing with girls. And, and I remember the moment she told me that I felt just a pit in my stomach. I was like, oh my gosh, this is me. Like, I, I think that's what I'm experiencing, and now I know that, that clearly there's something evil and wrong about me. And from that moment forward, I felt like, like I was forever in debt, that, that there's this big hole inside of me because I was gay, and that I had to do everything I could to fill it, but that no matter what I did, I was never going to be able to fill it. Um, and so at that point, when I was 12, that's when I started going to the temple, mm -hmm. uh, I got the priesthood. And I became uh, hyper-religious, um, which, again, I think is a pretty common experience. Um, but not in a way that, that, looking back, that was uplifting, but a way that was um, overwhelming, you know, where I felt like I had to wake up at 5.30 in the morning and read my scriptures for an hour, and if I didn't, I would feel so guilty the entire day. And I would, you know, do every single calling that I would ask and, or be asked to do and ask for more callings and... Um, and I developed uh, a pretty severe case of religious OCD. Or scrupulosity. A scru yeah, scrupulosity, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Where I had these intrusive thoughts constantly um, that were dictating how I had to live my life, but in a way that I was constantly on edge, constantly anxious. Uh, and it was hard, too, because um, these, the scrupulosity was, was reinforced by my community. Um, so, for example, something that happened to me all growing up is I would feel like I'd get these promptings from the Spirit like if I'm driving down the street, uh, if I drive past this light, I'm going to get in a car accident and I will, I will die. And so I had to take a 45 minute detour, you know, instead of just doing the 15 minute ride. And, and I remember one time I was on a date, a double date in high school with a uh, uh, fellow LDS kids. And I felt that intrusive thought come back in and I told them and they were like, yes, absolutely follow it. That's the spirit. Let's do this. And, and so I got these reinforcing messages that it was, it was good for me to do that. And um, I, I didn't realize how destructive that was and, and how overwhelming it was for me as just like a you know, 15, 16 year old kid. Let's talk about that destruction. What was it that started to destroy or erode who and what Matt was? It, you know, it would be things like if I watched a movie, like I remember when Mamma Mia came out and uh, there's lots of shirtless men in there and I would see a shirtless man and I would feel aroused and I would feel so guilty that I would have to leave the room, say a prayer like 10 times, because I felt like just because I had those feelings, I had sinned, and that I was putting not only my own like celestial well-being, but my family's. And so much pressure. And so it would take hours out of my day. You know, I wouldn't be able to see my friends on time because I was busy um, repenting over and over and over for things that I couldn't control. Um, and so in that way, I felt like, my actions uh, were starting to be shaped by these compulsions instead of shaped by what I truly wanted or, or who I actually was. We often talk about this being such a loss of bandwidth. We, we invest so much energy into shifting and changing who and what we are. Think of, think of where we could be if kind we of running, hadn't. Running away from yourself, right? Exactly. Yeah. If we hadn't invested all of that energy and strength into becoming something that we're not, we shortchange ourselves into becoming something that we were created to be. And, and I think this is just a great example for those who don't understand the queer experience. This is a, a great, just a really laser pinpoint sight into the experience of, an, of someone who is LGBTQ to see that this is what we deal with. These are the experiences that we have, the, 
just the intense ability to please other people and the intense ability to become what we think God wants for us, yeah. completely masking that the, the reality of who and what we are. And what I and sorry, what I loved about how you described it is, you know, as someone who's uh, studied scrupulosity as part of my my PhD. There is a difference between sincere religiosity because it provides you with fulfillment and meaning and purpose and scrupulosity that is uh, a compulsion, compulsive behavior that's developed to help neutralize uh, a distress stimuli. And the latter is not good. You think hyper-religiosity, well, that's got to be good because you're being extra, you're going to the temple a lot, you're reading the scriptures a lot, you're praying a lot. No, that's a disorder. So sincere edifying spirituality that's you know making you feel good amazing what you're talking about is literally a, a diagnosis in the in the dsm it's a disorder that leads to depression severe depression and anxiety it, i don't want to say that's your experience but no it it, yeah. it absolutely was yeah. Yeah, constantly anxious and and, and worried um it, it was awful and and i think combined with that um i really quickly um you know, started noticing how people were interpreting me. And I felt like I constantly had to present myself in a way that made them feel comfortable and that proved to them that I wasn't gay. And, and so like changing your speech pattern or changing my speech patterns or, um, not vocalizing what kind of music I like because it might seem too queer. Um, or, you know, I would go out of my way to be super flirty with women and, and go on tons of dates so people would say, oh, like, Matt's just kind of, you know, he's just like fruity or he's really nice, but but he's straight, you know. And and it got to the point where my, you know, active LDS friends, um, they would defend me against people who would, you know, make jokes about me being gay at school. And that just added to it where I thought, you know, oh, my gosh, my friends have just got into this sort of verbal argument in class defending me as straight. And I can't let them down now, you know, like, like imagine how betrayed my friends are going to feel if they find out that I'm actually gay. And so I, I felt like I was constantly people pleasing and doing everything to make everyone else happy and comfortable, but at the expense of, of me feeling safe and comfortable. Yeah. And that's hard. Yeah, super hard. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, uh, um, kind of dealt with that all growing up in high school, continued to be, uh, extremely religious. I was, uh, on seminary council here in Utah, um, did tons of different things with the church. I, uh, would go out with the missionaries as a 16 year old. And, uh, my senior year of high school is when the mission age changed. Um, so it's when suddenly I was the first group where 18 year olds could suddenly go out on missions. So I'm sitting in high school and my friends are starting to get their mission calls and I'm realizing, oh my gosh, in like six months, I could be on my mission. Um, I, I maybe should start working out this, you know, big, deep, dark sin that I have. So you thought of it as a sin? I thought, absolutely. Just to have the feelings? Just to have the feelings, okay. to have crushes on boys, to have, um, you know, to be aroused by Channing Tatum. So, so I want you to go right where you're going, but I want to ask before that, yeah. like, did you try and, you know, people are going to wonder, did you ever have any experimentation with, with, with boys or men as a high schooler and, or did you try and date women or did you like many just stay away from dating altogether and just have lots of friends? I know in Utah, there's this weird culture of like, you never date, you never get serious before your mission. So that's right. what I'm guessing you're going to say, but I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah ex exactly. Yeah. yeah. So no, I did not do any experimentation uh, in high school or middle school or anything. I was never like approached or coerced or harassed or, or, or well, like sexually harassed or anything. Not, nothing like that ever happened to me. Um, I did uh, date a lot of girls, um, but again, just casually. I never had a girlfriend, really. Um, what high school was it? Uh, Brighton, high Brighton High School. High school. Okay. Yeah, the yeah. Bengals. Yeah, um, Bengals. But, but, you know, I would uh, kiss a lot of girls. I, you know, had fun. We would make out or stuff like that. And, and I did that because, I mean, sure, it was fun, but also I felt like I had to do this to create this image of straight Matt. Um, was that distressing or was that just fine, neutral? No, it was top. It was super distressing. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Uh, why? Well, because like I, I, I can guess. I just <laughs> no, for say. sure. Because yeah. I, I guess I just felt like I always had something to prove, and I always constantly had to show people that I, that uh, I'm not something that I am. Um, yeah. Mm. So so the mission age change comes around, and I think, um, well, gosh, I believe in this church with my whole heart. I want to do everything I can to support it. I, of course, I want to go on a mission. Um, maybe it's time that I talk to my bishop. 
Uh, so I went to my bishop when I was 17 years old, a senior in high school, and this was the first time I ever came out to somebody. Um, so ever? I did, uh, ever. I had never told a single Parents, soul. I, I, would, I was even too scared to write it in my journal. Mm. I had like secret codes where I would say, you know the thing, or something where, where I could record it, but I, I didn't want anyone to even accidentally find my journal and see that I admitted I was gay. Um, so I show up to my bishop's office, and I tell him, Bishop, I think that I might struggle with same-sex attraction. Now, where did you learn that term? Where did I learn? I uh, just picked it up at mm -hmm. uh, devotionals or, um, you know, I remember a seminary teacher, uh, he kept like a, a cabinet file with talks about every issue. And one of the talks was about same-sex attraction. So one time I opened the drawer to look to see if there are any of them, but I was too scared to grab it in case anyone saw. Um, but, but. I knew that that was, um, you know, the term that we're supposed to use. Why are you smiling? Why are you smiling, Kyle? I smile because I also, I was a seminary president. Uh, so I was the one who ordered those. And I, too, was so worried about what other people would think, seeing that I was interested or had some reason to have that pamphlet. And so I took one, uh, a letter to a friend, and it's still in my mission scriptures today. But I, I ordered it through the distribution center catalog and then slipped it in my uh, mission scriptures, my scriptures in seminary, and then moved into my mission scriptures. But I, I get it. I, I know what that, yeah. that feeling is like, knowing that you, you are clinging to every resource available out there. And unfortunately, even, I mean, we're 10 years apart in age, uh, the only available resources out there to us, and, and so much so even today, for people in our situation, was the negative side of it, that there are, the options are, uh, prayerful church service, uh, extra callings, mixed orientation marriages, a uh, callous knees, bloody knuckles. If you're not, if you are not completely enveloped in uh, doing the right things, and your your sexuality is not changing, it's because you're not trying hard enough. And those are the messages that you and I grew up with, and still uh, the messages that that well intended intended church leaders today, stake presidents, bishops, auxiliary leaders are still teaching their youth today as they come, as 17-year-old Matt did in a bishop's office and says, can you help me? Um, I don't know how to fix this. And they say, how are you doing in the temple? How are you doing with church service? And, and I don't want to, I, I really am interested in what your bishop said to you, but in terms of commonality, yes, we, we, we cling to every one of those messages. Sometimes what they say, church members will look at the queer community and say, well, you just don't understand our doctrine well enough. And I can assure you, we probably know it better than most in terms of this topic. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I found myself in, in my bishop's office, and uh, he looks at me and he says, well, Matt, um, have you ever kissed a boy before? And I said, oh my gosh, <laughs> no, right like, absolutely him. not. No, I've never even held their hands. I've never like touched them anyway. In a, like, no, absolutely not. And he said, okay, good. And he said, well, have you ever kissed a girl? I said, oh, yeah, I've kissed a couple girls. And he said, oh, it's simple then. Just don't kiss boys and keep kissing girls. You don't. And so that that's the first. Problem solved. Right? Collect your Nobel Prize. You <laughs> solved it. So, so that, that was my first feedback I ever got. And, and, and kind of the message I received was like, okay, I guess I'm just supposed to not talk about this. I'm just supposed to keep pushing through and keep hiding it. And so again, I just felt like I was getting this validation that, that hiding myself and, and punishing myself and pushing myself into a mold was okay. And it was the right thing to do. And it's what God wanted me to do. And it would lead to what result maybe? Yeah. Well, I, I guess I just hoped it would lead to, you know, exaltation. A celestial kingdom, or at least becoming an angel, or something, you know. Well, and if nothing else, it allowed people the the spotlight to leave you, and and just allowed you to move on. That idea that you are molding yourself into something that you're not is a way to please everyone else, at the sacrifice of who you are. And what I think I was I was wondering is like like I think Kyle, you shared in your story. There's this very common perception amongst LGBTQ Mormons that if you're faithful enough, if you're righteous enough, if you go on your mission, that Heavenly Father maybe will take away your feelings of, quote, same-sex attraction and uh, de-gayify you so that when you return from your faithful mission, you'll be attracted to women and then you'll be able to follow on the Mormon train where the Mormon train wants to take you. Was that your hope? Or I don't want to inject that into your story. 
No, for sure, but okay. but absolutely it was. Okay. And, okay. and so, yeah, if I get feedback from a church leader, I'm going to follow it to a T. Yeah, if that's what my bishop told me, okay, I'm going to keep on kissing girls, never going to kiss a boy. I'm going to do exactly what I'm supposed to, and, and so that's what I did. Um, so a couple months later, I got my mission call. I was still in high school uh, to Sydney, Australia, a uh, Korean-speaking elder. So mm. I, I um, you know, stayed in, in uh, just a couple areas to work with uh, some of the Korean people there. Um, so I left, uh, like a month after I graduated high school, um, and had, uh, overall, I have some pretty positive feelings about my mission. Um, believe it or not, my family and I actually lived in Sydney when I was a child. And so a lot of the members there knew my mom and dad and kind of watched out for me. So in some ways I was spoiled, I think, uh, in the sense that I did feel really well taken care of. Um, and I was, uh, just as you'd ex probably expect from someone who struggles with, uh, religious scrupul scrupulosity, uh, extremely obedient, you know, wake up exactly at 6.30, exercise exactly 30 minutes. Um, you know, if I got a thought that I need to talk, some, talk to somebody, even if they were a big, scary businessman, like, gosh darn, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to go talk to them. And, and I, uh, I did everything that I could because just like you said, John, in the back of my head, I was thinking, if I can pull this off, if I can be the perfect missionary, then maybe God could help me out. Maybe I can become straight or maybe I can just like be strong enough to push through and to push past this. Um, and it did not work out that way. In fact, while I was on my mission, um, I only felt my sexual attractions uh, continue to, to grow and develop. Um, Sydney, Australia, one of the great things in retrospect about that place is there's lots of uh, very handsome men there, you know, lots of surfers and uh, uh, attractive men from all over the world. And, and so I would be walking on the streets and, and sort of the same thing as when I was a teenager. If I saw a man and I thought that he looked handsome, I would beat myself up the rest of the week. I thought, oh my gosh, I've lost the spirit and now I've lost the chance to convert somebody who really needs it. Mm. I am the worst person on earth. Uh, I'm, I'm no good. I, I, I better get to Sunday and take that sacrament because that's the only way I'm going to get clean. Um, and this feeling of always being dirty, no matter how hard I tried, really, really got to me. Um, as I imagine, probably hard for anyone not to. Um, and so, so explain if you, if this yeah. is part of your experience, what the Mormon teachings are about thoughts and how, to what extent are thoughts considered sinful and then how that would affect you when a thought comes into your brain. And maybe that wasn't yeah. part, part of your experience, but oh, I, I know, I know the church has some pretty strong teachings about thoughts. Yes, exactly. Cause again, you're not, it's not like you're, you know, acting seeking it, out sex workers as a missionary. Oh. It's not like you're hitting on your companions. This is all going on inside. Or your maybe head. you were. Exactly. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> no, I definitely was not. No. Um, yeah, I was, I was raised to believe that, that even a thought is a sin to even think something is a sin. And so sort of this idea that I need to keep not just my actions, but my mind clean, because if my mind is having these inappropriate thoughts, then I might as well be committing that sin. Um, so yeah, so I felt accountable for my, for my thoughts. I felt like I was supposed to be able to control them. Um, and I tried everything. I memorized so many scriptures where I would just try to recite scriptures over and over and over again in my head, or I would sing songs to myself, church hymns. And, and um, unfortunately, I found that the more that I did that, the more that these thoughts would come, like the thoughts I didn't want, where it was almost like, uh, you know, I, I hear the analogy, if you tell someone to not think about a carrot, all they're going to do is think about a carrot. And, and I think that's maybe in some ways what I was doing to myself, um, which just caused this, this like torrent of just constantly being anxious and feeling unworthy, um, you know, while I'm thinking about the church 24 seven, um, on my mission. So, um, it got to a point about maybe a year, year and a half into my mission, um, where I really slipped into some deep depression and some, and some deep anxiety where to, to the point that I was, I was struggling to smile. Um, which I'm a, smile a lot. Yeah, I'm a pretty smiley person. <laughs> I like both my mom and I, I mean, and my little sister, like I, I smile when I take an exam, like it's my resting face. So, um, so the fact that, that I was having a hard time, I think that really speaks that, that I was in a dark place. And so I had a, mm. like an interview with my mission president's wife. Uh, she sort of does like casual interviews when your companion's doing a, a mission president interview. And, and I didn't tell her I was gay, but I said, sister house, I'm, 
I'm struggling. I think I might be depressed. And so she was awesome. She said, we've got a, a psychologist missionary who's in New Zealand that you can call for a transfer. Uh, so she put me in touch with him. And so for six weeks, I um, uh, once a week, I got on the phone for an hour and had a therapy session, uh, which was the first time I'd ever done therapy. And uh, this therapist who uh, I believe if I remember correctly, he was a licensed therapist who was serving a mission for the church. Um, he's the second person that I ever told that I was gay. Um, and I told him this in tears because, you know, I thought this man doesn't know who I am. He's in another country. I feel safe uh, telling him my secret. And uh, he was the first person, I think, that gave me some honest feedback where he said, you know, Elder Easton, um, this gay thing's not going to go away. He's like, when you get home from your mission, unless there's some mighty miracle, like you're, you're going to keep having these feelings. And, and I think the first step for you is, is you, you got to kind of accept that. And as a, as a young missionary who believed wholeheartedly in, in the power of Jesus Christ, I could not accept that. <laughs> I thought, okay, I know you're a therapist, but you are using some secular logic here and I'm not going to buy into it. Um, so I, I talked to him for six weeks uh, for full transfer and, um, you know, he gave me some, some tools about mindfulness to kind of calm my anxiety and, and it helped a little bit. Um, but I, I really did not believe him that, that I would be stuck being gay forever. So was your therapist, was he part of mission medical, like LDS family services side? And do you think he was LDS? Yes, he was LDS. He was a missionary. So I called him elder. Oh, I forget gotcha, his name, gotcha. but Sorry if I missed that part. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. So he was um, called on a mission to be a missionary therapist, gotcha. basically, for, for the Pacific area. Um, so yeah, so that kind of got me towards the end of my mission where I'm starting to think about possibly reconciling some of this dissonance or thinking about it, but uh, still not quite ready. And uh, as I got towards the end of my mission, uh, my mission president was also about to head home from his mission. He left, I think, a month and a half, maybe two months before I did. Um, and so as he's getting ready to leave, I'm starting to think about what I'm going to do when I leave my mission. And I'm starting to panic because I think, okay, I'm still at this point where I've been righteous, but I'm still getting these gay feelings. Uh, what am I going to do when I go home and go to BYU? How am I going to date a woman? How am I going to be able to get married? How am I going to be able to have kids? I mean, these thoughts were constantly stressing me out. And so as my mission president uh, left the mission, we had a chance to do one final interview with him. So I get into my interview and I finally come clean. I say, Elder ha or President Howes, uh, I think that I have same-sex attraction and I am so scared to go home. Please, as my, as my leader, I know you're leaving. Tell me what to do. Um, and the first thing he did was he assured me, he was like, Elder Easton, I had no idea you were gay. You never gave off any gay vibes. Uh, he didn't say vibe, but which, you know, reaffirmed to me, okay, it's good that I'm trying to mask this and hide this. And, and at least it's working somewhat. Mm. Uh, so then the next thing is he said, um, well, you know what? Let, let's have the spirit do the talking and let me give you a blessing. So he put it, he put his hands on my head and he blessed that from that moment forward, every homosexual feeling I had would be replaced with a heterosexual one. He blessed me that I would find a wife who I would be sexually attracted to, that I would marry and have children with. He blessed me that I would become a bishop one day and that I would become a leader in Zion. And I remember, um, like it, it hurts so much to think about this now, but that was probably the best day of my life. Um, I was so happy because I felt like I was, I was cured. I felt like I got the miracle I wanted. And, um, that the power of, of the atonement of Jesus Christ was real. It was promised to me by my priesthood leader, and all I had to do was be faithful. Um, so I left that meeting thinking, okay, problem solved. I've done it. I've um, I figured out the, the combination. I'm going to be good. So mm. uh, finished out my mission, feeling super awesome. I come home. Two weeks later, I'm at BYU starting my first semester and uh, become elders quorum president. I start uh, dating all the women that I can find in my ward, you know, doing all that I can. Mm. And um, uh, my homosexual feelings were still there and I was not getting heterosexual feelings. You know, I would um, kiss girls, have a good time, but I wouldn't feel any sort of special attraction. And uh, pretty quickly that took me to a really dark place because I thought I've been promised this power through the atonement. And if it's not working, clearly that's my fault. Clearly, I don't have enough faith. Clearly, I am still sinning. Clearly, my thoughts are still evil um, because if I were just good, 
I could I could capitalize and bank on that promise. Um, and so it just it, I I felt like I'd failed my faith, uh, and I felt I felt shunned by Jesus Christ. But but I didn't blame him. I blamed myself. Um, and yeah, that it sucked. And I, I felt like I had no one to turn to. I had no one to talk to. Because you can't say, well, God. God blew it or God's not doing his part. <laughs> yeah. Like, by definition, God and Jesus do their part. And even so. under the guise of the blessing, it was because of your faith and your actions. Therefore, your faith wasn't strong enough. And clearly, whatever you were doing or not doing, either, and this is familiar in Mormonism, these sins of omission or commission, what is it that you're not doing by choice? And what is it that you're not doing because you don't know that you're not doing them right? Yeah. And this is just such a mind-blowing and boggling experience for the, the LGBTQ person. You're saying that even if you're doing every, you know, even if you're not breaking any of the rules, there's always a million things you could be doing. So there's yes. never a point where you can ever really feel like you are doing everything possible. Yeah, there's right. this great yeah. Mormon message that, and it's kind of even a Maya Angelou message, we don't know what we don't know. And so therefore we jump back into heavy scripture study to try to learn or just a deep dive back into the words of the prophets to see what we missed in some other obscure lesson that we're not doing that we should be doing therefore the blessings of the atonement the blessings the literal blessing that your mission president gave you can be effective and that's where it just eats and erodes exactly exactly and, and i feel like it also encouraged me to just um like sacrifice more of myself um like in in uh like to support the church in, in the sense that you know i would give up hanging out with my friends like a normal college student because I thought, nope, I've got to go out with the missionaries three times a week. Mm -hmm. And now I've got to, um, you know, I've got to pray about every single man in my elders quorum by name and make sure that I'm receiving revelation for them. Mm -hmm. And I've got to make sure that I've signed up for at least one religion class every semester, if not two, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, constantly this feeling of, of never enough, never enough, never enough. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of where I was at. Um, and I, I felt like I was probably the only person on BYU campus who was gay and who was dealing with this. I, I, I like honestly, truly believed that because wow. I thought, you know, other people who are gay, they have probably figured this out. They're not stupid enough to come to BYU like, like I was. But I, but I went there in part because I was so afraid that if I went somewhere like University of Utah or another school that, that I would meet gay people and that maybe they would like coerce me or, or lead me down a dark path. So I chose BYU almost as a, as like a safety net where I thought this is the only place where I can be gay or, or where I'll be the only gay person and I won't be tempted or influenced uh, negatively. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So which, which now I'm like, Oh my gosh, no, there's hundreds, if not thousands of us there. Um, well, I mean, there, there've been some recent surveys or studies indicating that upwards of potentially 20% of BYU campus <laughs> identifies as either a sexual or a gender minority in some way. And Circle just did complete that uh, study, and they uh, interviewed nearly 8,000 uh, BYU students, and 13.2% uh, said their sexuality was not straight. Wow. So, th they, so that was specific to Provo, BYU Provo, which I think is a fascinating study. And when we dig further down into this conversation with what is happening at BYU today, I w if I were a church leader or an administrator at BYU, I would absolutely take note of that study saying, if we want to alienate a certain population, we need to realize that 13% of our population in a survey that wasn't church correlated, yeah. they were willing to answer that type of a question. Yeah. Now, how much the reality of that is how much bigger a second study comes out and says nearly 23%. And then, uh, what about siblings and family members who attach to that? So we're, we are talking about a large swath of, of Mormonism at that specific university. Yeah. And, and one thing that Kara and I talked about just a little bit before this interview comes in is as, as a gay person, as a gay man going into BYU, you had to have known that you were gay. What was it about BYU that you wanted to use? Was there something about BYU that you wanted to use to help fix you as well? Because I think that's a valid question for someone potentially looking at BYU as an option who is LGBTQ. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I again, I thought that that BYU would be the only place that I could be safe, that I I could ensure that I would be in an environment where I wouldn't be 
tempted or confused to um, to to leave the church or to accept my homosexuality. Or experiment. Or experiment, yeah, exactly. Because right. yeah. I'm like, yeah, clearly none of that's going on at BYU. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but, but that's what I thought, and so that's why I chose BYU. And, and it's also a, a really great school. There's some really awesome things about BYU, um, which, which we can, we can get yeah. into as we go. But I was just going to say that the other thing is I talk about the bubble, just how – how within a real high demand religion culture, very, very well-known things outside the bubble are just never discussed or known within the bubble. Yes. And the fact that you could be, you know, in a, in a, a university of 25, 30,000 people think you might be the only gay person there. When again, we know that at least 2,500 to 3,000 people all around you were experiencing something very similar it just goes to show how how strong the bubble is absolutely know, inside the church inside utah county and inside byu well the flip side of that is also how strong the machine is at keeping those voices and those identities covered isolated yeah. isolated i like i like the word isolated that there is a movement behind there to ensure that those 2500 stay as closeted and closed off as possible. And I this, think that's reality yeah. as and well. And this is going to flow to why you came out later. You know? Absol- absolutely. Right. So we'll, you know, we're, we're setting the groundwork. No, that's, bit. that's where that leads right into what I want to share <laughs> yeah, next. Yeah. 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 And, and, so throughout my life, I think I never, I never really knew a gay person personally. Um, you know, I think there was one boy who was out as gay at my high school, um, which <laughs> I purposely avoided him because I didn't want to be associated mm-hmm. For, the, for people to extrapolate that maybe I'm gay as well. And I think, you know, maybe I taught one lesson to a gay person on my mission, I, I, you know, but, but I didn't really know anyone personally uh, until my second semester at BYU. Um, so still my freshman year, uh, I'm going to this dark time, wondering where my place is with the atonement and uh, political science major. So I'm in my first international relations course, uh, which is also count as a, as a general education course. So there were all sorts of upperclassmen, lowerclassmen in this big class. And um, there was a boy that sat one row in front of me, just like a couple seats to the left, uh, whose name was Harry Fisher. And um, I didn't know Harry super well. Uh, I think, you know, we did a couple like class exercises and maybe I talked to him once or twice. And, um, you know, I, I might have asked him to clarify a comment or something. So I knew who he was, um, but I didn't know him very well. And, and he, I believe he was a senior at BYU. And partway through the semester when we're in this course, um, one day he just stopped showing up to class. Uh, and then, uh, and then a week later, my, my professor gets up and in very vague terms, she says, um, you know, we've, we've lost a classmate. If any of you are ever struggling, please come and see me. And, and I thought, what, this is weird. And, and then I realized, oh my gosh, this, this boy, Harry is no longer here. And, uh, within a day or two, I saw the news articles, um, where Harry Fisher had come out as gay, uh, during that semester. And, and I think because of some of that, that response that he got, some of the rhetoric in the community, um, obviously the turmoil that, that a lot of us experience and understand, uh, he ended up taking his own life. Um, yeah, and I just remember being a 20-year-old freshman, and the first gay person that I ever knew um, took his own life. And I thought I was looking at myself in a mirror. And I thought, oh my gosh, if I ever come out, if I ever sh- speak my truth, even just say that I'm gay, um, am I going to be led to that same outcome? It's just a really, really scary thought to have and, and really isolating. And, and just, I mean, it just messed with me, messed with my head. It, it freaked me out. Um, and, and I think uh, that, that that's a pretty common experience for people like me, uh, for the queer community, where constantly, you know, throughout, especially at BYU, the only people that, that I saw while I was there who were like me um, were ones who were ending up dead, you know, and I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want that same outcome, but, but is it inevitable? Is, is the only place that, that the world and the church has to offer me is, is one where I'm not in it. I mean, those, those are the kind of the messages that, that I felt like I was receiving and, and it was tough. <laughs> can, can you put, can, is there any way you can put let, let, straight people just have no idea. Like, I mean, there are straight people who, who have suicidal ideation and or complete successfully complete death by suicide. But, and we should obviously probably provide a bit of a trigger warning for those who might be sensitive to these sorts of things to practice self care um, to the extent that you need to, as we talk about something very serious, but 
for let's just say the average straight person, the average Orthodox straight Mormon that has just no empathy or understanding for why being a student at BYU in a Orthodox Mormon faith would lead to those types of thoughts and or behaviors. Can you help uh, kind of describe the experience and or the mindset that would put someone in a position to to think in such dark terms? And before terms? you go there, just know the comments on YouTube. Everyone, A, loves your hair, and everyone wants to know you are so loved right now by a, a thousand plus people watching. So, thank you so now much, answer everyone. John's question. Thank you. And thanks for commenting on my hair. I was worried about it. So thank you. Yeah. Everyone, that's the number uh, one comment you're getting. It's very Berkeley. It's very Berkeley. <laughs> it's bra- that's what my parents say. Yeah, I got to fit in with the, the Bay Area. So, um, yeah. So if if I uh, if if I understand what you're asking, you're saying what what about coming out kind of puts people in a place where they might consider what, what just, about being gay at BYU, being closeted gay at BYU, yeah. and or then coming out could could put someone in such a place where they think that that might be the, the only option. the only or the best option for them. Yeah. Just take some time to describe wh- how and why that might happen as a student. Absolutely. Well well for me as a closeted student, I remember um I'm const- we're constantly getting this message that there is nothing more important than getting married in the temple and raising up a family to bring to the celestial kingdom. And every time I hear that message, I'm feeling by one most important duty I'm supposed to complete in this life, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. So what's the point? You know, I'm, I, I might as well just, you know, kind of call it quits right now and, and get out of this because I can't take this pressure when I know that I can't live up to this. And, and that if I try to, I'm not going to be very happy. I'm not going to have a very fulfilling life. Um, so for me, at least, that's kind of what put me in that place. And and I know from the experience, you know, my experience since coming out in the community is, as well as, um, you know, other, other people who are at BYU, um, the people don't always react positively. In fact, more often than not, um, they, they take a simple uh, declaration of identity a, a, as like a politicized statement to debate or, or to like argue or try to push back on. So, I mean, I don't, I, I, I can't speak to what Harry experienced, for example, but, but I can imagine that that there are some people who are maybe unhappy or who pushed back or, or who said, you know, you are, you are denying God right now. You are, um, you know, you're not trusting him. You are doing something that is not okay. Path to sin, maybe, you know. And I remember when um, February 12th of 2016, when Harry took his life, he right before that did write a Facebook post where he thanked those people who did reach out to him and offered him uh, just a, a bit of love and I think the second part of this that correlates with what John is talking about is that Harry wasn't a lost cause and Harry wasn't rogue. The very last internet search on his phone was on LDS tools, searching this topic, trying to find a place where God loved him. That is the queer experience. And it hurts because I know exactly what that feels like. And I think that more people than not know <laughs> knows what that feels like. Sorry, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, no I, I, apologies. I mean, <laughs> this is... This is tough stuff. This is tough stuff. This is this is a reality. Yeah. And 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 I know that it's not just my reality. And I think that's sometimes what makes me so emotional is is I is this is too common of an experience. Um yeah, so that was my first year at BYU. Um I I'm grateful at least that that while these these experiences socially were, were pretty negative. I did have a really, really positive experience in my department um, where I found out, oh, I, I really like political science, you know, and I really like the professors in the department. And some of them, you know, reached out to me and said, hey, you should consider, um, you know, taking more courses or trying this research. And and in that sense, I think that was that helped distract me or, or kind of compartmentalize a little bit where I said, okay, I'm struggling right here, but but I found a place where, where I can feel like, I can give back and be valued academically. Um, and so I'm gonna put all my focus in there. Um, so I became 
you know, a very rigorous student, uh, worked really hard to keep my 4.0 GPA, trying to get involved in every club that I can. And I think that, um, well, I'd, I'd like to say that it's because I'm just, you know, a, a natural go-getter. I, I honestly think that it was sort of more a response just to keep myself alive, honestly, to keep myself um, from going back to that dark place. Stay busy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I just ask really quickly, I, I remember in the news within the past five or so years, the story of, a, of another student, and again, a, a bit of a trigger warning for those who are sensitive to these sorts of things, jumping off like the highest floor of the Tanner building at BYU in an attempt to, to die by suicide. Did that happen before, during, or after your time there? It was during my time. I believe it was my senior year. Okay, you were going to get to that. I, exactly. Oh, oh, no, oh, no, I was. I just, um, I remember that. Um, that was your senior year. That was my senior year, so yeah. You had so two, at least two public yes. suicide attempts and or completions and, uh, well, uh, uh, of LGBT students, correct? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and Harry Fisher and then the student who was in the Tanner building um, are the two, I think, most public ones from my time at BYU, but... I know every I know of people every single year that I was at BYU um, who were queer who took their own lives. So it's um, happening every year. It's happen at least while I was yeah, there. It was yeah, yeah. usually though it, it would happen you know a little more quietly off off campus or, or so. And so I, I think there wasn't as much media attention. But but yeah, we're I I, I watched my classmates uh, die l like left and right. You know, people like me and and they're the only people that I'm seeing. I, I'm not seeing a single queer person who is. Um, surviving BYU, you know, and, and, and that's, that's a hard place to be put in mentally is just, you know, a 20, 21 year old student um, where, you know, and, and in my political science research, uh, there, there is evidence that shows just how important representation is in, in politics, for example, where, where it's only when we can see what people like us are, are capable of doing that we can, that we can feel that for ourselves. And um, yeah, anyway, so after my first year at BYU, um, I had uh, three months off from my summer vacation, didn't have a job yet, and uh, uh, one of my good mission companions, we had served together for, gosh, 10, 11 months, almost a whole year, um, so he's one of my best friends, uh, and we decided, we're like, we were Korean-speaking elders, I'd never been to Korea, um, let's go take a trip to South Korea, uh, so I was there for, I think, three and a half weeks, maybe a month, um, just checking out Korea, having a good time. And of course, I, I got a little curious. I got on my phone and looked up, uh, you know, where the gay scene is in, in South Korea. Um, but I was just telling myself just because I wanted to see what it was like. But of course, I wouldn't go. And um, it got to the end of my trip in Korea where one night I was like, you know what? Uh, to my friend, I was like, I really want to kiss a Korean girl. You know, again, just trying to put up that wall of showing that I'm straight and and that, you know, I like women. And, and he said, well, Matt, that's great. You can go out, go find a girl to kiss. That is definitely not my scene, so I'm going to stay back at the hotel. Um, so I went out for the first time ever in my life um, to, like, this, this college-y part of town in South Korea uh, where there were, like, a couple clubs and young people. And so I get there, and um, I th I'd like to think I'm a pretty friendly person, so I make, a, I make a couple friends there. I'm not drinking or anything. I'm just dancing and um, find a cute girl there. I'm talking to her. We start kissing a little bit, and um, I'm feeling absolutely nothing. I'm like, this is so boring. <laughs> I'm just I'm, – I'm not vibing. And, and she um, – after a certain point, she, like, whispers in my ear, and she's like, hey, do you want to come back to my place? And I felt like I was Joseph and Potiphar's wife. And I'm like – I was like, oh, I just need to go to the bathroom real quick. And I turned around, and I ran out of the club, and I ran all the way down the street. Because, um, of course, you know, I, I, I'm a good Mormon boy. I'm not going to do anything like that. And um, so I'm, like, running away, and I hail a taxi, and I get into the taxi, and we start driving back to my hotel. And I look at the, um, the GPS or whatever, and I see that we're going to pass by um, the gay district in South Korea. It's called Itaewon. And... Right at that moment, it's it's like, what, midnight or one in the morning? And I think, okay, I'm here across the world in South Korea all by myself. Nobody knows who I am. It's not really Mormon people around. Maybe maybe I should just go see what, what a gay club is like. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to kiss anybody. I'm not going to break any rules. I just want to see gay people like myself because I've never seen that before. Um... So I have the taxi driver drop me off in Itaewon. I go to this, this gay club, 
And within like a minute and a half, I'm kissing a boy. And for it the was first time. For the first time at in age, my life. At age what? Uh, I was 21 at that point. Yeah. First time I'm kissing a boy. Yeah. And, and you had to go across the world to feel safe to do it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it was amazing. I felt this like this like spark throughout my whole body. And you liked it? I, I know. And for the first time, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is why all my you know friends in high school were so obsessed with kissing each other and, and making out. And I'm like, this is what kissing is supposed to feel like. This is this is what like romance and 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 I don't know, arousal, this is this is what it can be. This is amazing. And you know, that feeling was immediately accompanied by overwhelming guilt and shame. Where I mean, I was wearing my garments at the time, you know, I, I was very, um, very still devout and religious. And and so I leave that club and just break down. You know, I'm in the middle of Korea on some mm. like dirty street at, at two in the morning, just feeling like I have betrayed God that I've committed the biggest sin that I am I am left to the influence of Satan now and um, you know I was also visiting people that I had taught on my mission who were back in Korea and I felt like I had let them all down um, you know I'd I'd broken the honor code at BYU even though it was over the summer and that's a scary thought all by itself um, and yeah I was just destroyed which is you know I wish I could go back and just hold myself and, and say you know I wish you could just enjoy such a normal experience that everyone should be able to enjoy of, of kissing someone, you know? And, and in those moments, what bargains or deals did you try to make with God as you stepped out of that club and, and start processing and analyzing that shame and guilt? Because I think that's probably very familiar with many who will listen to your story and remember that first kiss was, uh, Father, I have sinned, therefore I'm going to do this, this, and this now. Or uh, what was that interaction like with a higher power in those moments? Yeah, I, I am, um, wow, I'm, I'm like, you you know what that's like. I, I didn't even tell you that, but then I'm like, of course you know, because this is so common. And um, yeah, tons of bargains going through my head where suddenly I'm, I'm like, God, please, I will go to the temple every single day. I will go out with the missionaries more. I think the next day I, I met up with the missionaries in Korea who I didn't know and went proselyting with them on the street. I mean, I was I was like, okay, again, my like debt has just gotten ever, ever more deeper and it's time to just pile it back on. Um, so- And can I, and can I yeah. just add, I'm sorry, yeah, just sure. that in, in today's modern Orthodox Mormon context, and you tell me if I'm wrong, Kyle, there are bishops that actually say that that t will counsel a gay Mormon. Well, kissing's not against the law of chastity. Yeah. So, number one, you're having a way later than normal sort of normative human experience of just trying to discover what gets you excited, what are you attracted to, what do you like. So that's completely normal, and it, it's 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 almost tragic that you have to wait that long but it's totally normal. And it's actually not even technically against the law of chastity. And I think Matt brings up a really good point. No, it's not in terms of most Mormon vernacular against the law of chastity, but we are held to a different standard because we have the honor code. And Matt, you are a BYU student, therefore you have an extra layer of responsibility. And that's where that, that just compounds itself again and again. Oh, so I just so many feelings and experiences right now. I just think of and my heart breaks for 20 something year old Matt. Cause every, every, every straight person knows how great their first kiss is, <laughs> how special that is. And how, how normal it, it, it's something that a straight person doesn't say, Oh, I had to, I didn't have to think about whether or not there would be a repercussion for kissing or for holding a hand or even going into a, a straight area of a bar or a straight area of town to attract another person that I was attracted to. Those things aren't common uh, things that we worry about as straight people. But you had to analyze every single second of that experience and, and second guess and, and recount all of those steps, which is just fascinating. And I think that is a great look into the experience of an LGBTQ person. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful, though, in that moment that I did have one thought that I think is good, <laughs> and that's that I needed to talk to somebody, that, I, that if I was left in my own head... I was not going to be okay. Um, so I called my aunt, which thankfully, I mean, it was like the middle of the night in Korea, but it was a, a normal time in Utah. 
Uh, so my aunt, who um, is basically like a second mom, you know, very close with her, uh, spent summers at her house. You know, I, I really trust her. I called her just weeping, saying, Aunt Amy, I have broken my covenants. I have destroyed my future. I feel so terrible. And thankfully, you know, she's just trying to talk me down, saying, breathe, Matt, it's going to be okay. And um, she gave me some really interesting advice. She said, you know, Matt, you just got off your mission where – you spent two years helping investigators like learn about the church and and do some trial and error and find the truth for themselves. And she's like, in this moment, treat yourself as an investigator. She's like, give yourself some space. All you're doing is just checking out some truth, you know, and 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 whether or not it's your truth. Um, what a cool aunt. Yeah, she's pretty awesome. I want to hug this aunt. And did she know that you were gay? Did you jump into that part of the story or just say, I Oh, yes, I did. I, okay. I came out to her in that moment. So she's the, what, one, two, three, fourth person I came out to. <laughs> so, yeah. And, well, she, and is she kind of a progressive Mormon or like, um, you know, or I guess I don't, you shouldn't have to speak for her, but yeah, that's, yeah, I guess I'm just loving that. That's all I'm saying. I'm loving that yes. response. If you're Very listening, response. Aunt Amy, thumbs up yeah, for Amy, yeah. thumbs up from John for what a cool response. Yeah, it, it, it was. Wasn't um, shaming, you know. Yeah. I think. It, it wasn't. No, it yeah. was great, and, and I think it's what I needed to hear. So mm -hmm. so that kind of took a little bit. I mean, I still felt a ton of guilt and shame, but it took off a little bit. And and kind of with that experience under my belt, again, keeping it hidden, not telling a soul. I'm like, besides Amy, no one's ever going to know that I kissed this boy. I'm just going to bury that away like I've buried everything else away. And and I started my um, second semester at, or my second year at BYU. And um, during my second year at BYU, so I'm a sophomore now, uh, my first week of school, I saw a flyer for a um, counseling therapy group uh, at the counseling center at BYU. CAPS. It, yeah, CAPS. It was called Reconciling Faith and Feelings. And it was kind of advertised as the first like therapy group that was available to students who maybe were struggling with their sexuality. So I saw this flyer. I'm like, okay, mm. awesome. This is like accredited therapists who are on Team BYU, who I can trust, who are going to help me um, live a straight life. That's 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 honestly the thought I came in. So I signed up for this therapy class, excited that um, you know my mission president didn't help, uh, my mission my mission itself didn't help, scriptures aren't helping, but maybe this therapy group is going to help me um, become straight. Mm. So I signed up for this therapy group, and I show up there, and it's the first time that I met other queer people like myself um, wow. who hadn't, you know, um, taken their own lives or who were in a club in Korea. Mm. Um, and it was the first time that I was exposed um, to the nuance of our experience, which was super awesome. Uh, where, and I mean that in the sense that I got in there, I think there were nine of us, maybe there were 10, and then there were two counselors, uh, BYU counselors. And uh, there was there were some students who were like, I treasure my faith absolutely. I will never act on my homosexuality, um, but I just need a place where I can kind of vent and to help me be a better active member. And then on the same spectrum, there was you know somebody who um, was gay, living with their boyfriend, totally ex Mormon, who was just trying to get out of BYU. And then there were lots of people in the middle. Um, there it was mostly gay men. I think there were one, maybe two uh, gay women in there as well. And um, I really do think that that saved my mental health in the sense where I thought, okay, wait, first of all, I'm not alone. I'm not as isolated as I thought I was. There are other people who get what this feels like. And then in that same token, I felt for the first time I had a space where I could say, okay, this week I'm going to be totally devout. And next week I'm going to... Um, be a little angry towards the church. And the next week I'm going to be um, just try for a week to just be happy that I'm gay. And then the next week I'm going to mm. be sad that I'm gay. I, it just, it gave me a safe space to like test, test out what my truth was and where I wanted to be. To test out this reality that there isn't just one way to be gay. Yes. Yes. Which seems to be kind of a common theme that we think if you're this way, this is the, the, the trail or the channel that you follow. I like that. I like the I like the ability to recognize within yourself that you have options. Yeah. And I like that it's a BYU CAPS therapy group that's seemingly supportive of you absolutely owning or trying to understand your identity and work with it versus suppress it and hide it and deny it. That's great. Kudos to CAPS. Which, right? Without electricity or vomit inducing Oh yeah, medications. The dark reference to the seventies. Yes, yeah. 
check out uh, on the record for more information about what Kyle just referred to. <laughs> That's deep. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I first joined, to be honest, I was a little mad that they weren't just giving me a prescription on how to be straight. But by the end of... By it the wasn't end of, advertised that way, though, right? It was not. No, no, okay, no. Yeah. It, was, it was very but vaguely that's what advertised. You yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's what I wanted. So, But, you know, by the end of the semester, I was so grateful because um, for the first time, I felt a little bit more sure of myself or at least a little less alone. Um, can, it, can, can, I'm sorry. Yeah. I had, I had uh, dinner with some friends who either work for BYU or love it last night. And uh, we'll get to Holland's thing later, but the point they wanted to make with me is BYU isn't all bad. Like BYU does some good things. And I would say that the counseling center at BYU, uh, you know, um, counseling and psychological services or CAPS has some amazing, you know, PhD level psychologists who are LGBT affirming, who are supportive of people who are questioning their faith. There's, as I understand it, a really good firewall between CAPS and the Honor Code Office, so that, you know, at least up until now, and I don't know if this is true about BYU-Idaho, but at least at BYU-Provo, you can go to CAPS, explore whatever you need to explore, and not fear like it's going to put your university status in jeopardy. And so I just want to just maybe give credit where credit is due, that BYU maybe has done a really good job with CAPS, and, and it seems like it, um, it provided you with something very important and valuable. Absolutely, it yeah. did. Um, yeah, and, and I learned during that first uh, semester in this group that the group had existed before. Um, I, I can't remember if it was like a decade before or two decades. I mean, it, it had been a long time in the past, um, but that it had been shut down um, because some of the people had started uh, meeting up outside of group, started dating. And so there was sort of, there was this pressure put on by the counselors where they said, you know, don't ruin this. <laughs> don't ruin it because because if anyone catches wind or they s perceive this place as just like a chance to meet other gay people and hook up, um, then it's going to get shut down. Yeah, and and that sort of clued me in that that even just existing with other queer people at BYU, I wouldn't be safe because I could be perceived as breaking the honor code or or as wanting to sin. Um, and, and so even though I felt safe in this group, I still did not feel very safe connecting like with anyone outside uh, at BYU because I didn't want to be seen or associated. And, um, and, and I think, I mean, I guess this is speculation, so take it with a grain of salt, but from my understanding, that's sort of a similar reason why the club on campus USGA was kind of kicked out of campus because they didn't want, or they, I, I guess maybe there were concerns from administration or someone that someone like me could show up and maybe meet a future boyfriend or something at this club and they could not have that. Um, so also during this time, I did experience, um, some pretty awesome things with, with my family as well. Um, I have a, a very large LDS family. I've got 24 aunts and uncles, 56 first cousins, a very typical, large Mormon family. Um, uh, and we're all very, very close. In fact, uh, people on live stream aren't seeing this, but two of my cousins are here supporting me today. Um, they're, they're practically siblings and you know, we're really close and, um, Having that many aunts and uncles, uh, as you can imagine, there are some who are quite devout, who were quite outspoken on LGBTQ issues. And, uh, you know, even in college, whenever I'd go to like a family party or something, you know, I might have a really conservative uncle who speaks up and says, uh, you know, isn't this gay stuff just awful or, or look at, you know, X, Y, Z and, and made me feel like I was really not in a safe place with my family. Um, but I had a super awesome cousin uh, who uh, I've talked to since I came out. And, and you know, he, like, like most people, he was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure Matt's gay. Like, there's a pretty good, pretty good chance. And he thought, you know, I'm not going to pressure Matt into, like, like I'm not going to corner him and say, Matt, tell me, are you gay? Uh, but, but my cousin, his name's Brett, he was like, you know what? I'm going to do what I can to create a safe space so that Matt knows that I support him so that if he ever did feel safe enough to come out, that he could come to me. And so the, the way that this looked was that at our family parties, um, Brett would speak up and push back against my uncle. And he would say, you know, I really don't believe that. I actually don't think gay people are so bad or so wrong. And first of all, I was impressed because I'm like, I'm too, too afraid to ever say that because I don't want someone thinking I'm gay. Um, so it was almost like Brett was kind of taking that heat for me. Um, but then also I felt like, you know, even though he was talking to my uncle, he was talking to me you know, trying to say, Matt, I'm a safe place. I'm a safe person. Um, and, and that I believe is Christ-like love, you know, that, 
that someone advocating for, for LGBTQ people just speaking up, letting me know that he didn't think that I'm some horrible, evil person, um, that's, that's like the greatest love that I think I, I've ever felt, especially in terms of my identity. And it's something so small. I, I like, honestly, that's not hard to do just to say, yeah, I think gay people are great or, or you know, like Ellen's awesome or, or, you know, I, I think pride festivals are cool. Like th that subtle shift in rhetoric um, can really make a difference in someone's life. And I know that because it made a difference in mine. And it doesn't cost the person offering that type of love anything. Can I ask a follow up to that? Um, for believers who are in the chat, who are maybe listening to this and they, they, they love queer people and they want LGBTQ friends of theirs and family to feel safe, but then they also have that rhetoric of, you know, uh, love the sin or hate the sin. So somebody asked, don't like condone, right? yeah, uh, can somebody disagree with you without you feeling unsafe? <laughs> can somebody, can somebody disagree that you are, whether it's choosing to be gay or without making you feel unsafe? a tough question that's and, and that's a good one i think it's important to ask I, I mean i think just you know my my like initial response is um like what is there to to disagree about like this this part of myself being gay is not something that's up for debate it's not something i'm ever going to be able to change or i can change it's not like you hadn't tried right yeah no i exactly and so so when when i hear that people are like well can i still disagree with you or, or speak peacefully it's like disagreeing with your blonde hair or your blue eyes like, yeah i it's, disagree it's with your height my intrinsic your height identity. is just problematic for me right but, but yeah. even further than that isn't this a disagreement of what mormonism and even other religious communities believe that if we do know that you are created by a perfect creator isn't it disingenuous and on the other side of the coin, the opposite side of this, to believe that you were created wrong would would lead someone to believe that God made a mistake in your creation. And within Mormonism or other religious societies, there is no room for this idea that God makes mistakes. So it, it, to answer that question, I don't see that either. That is not up for debate. If, if you believe God is perfect and his creations are perfect, and this is how Matt and Kyle and the millions of other people who are created queer were created, then we have to believe that this is part of a plan. And, and I think that is the religious question that should be asked. Do we believe God is perfect or not? And then I think in the back of the minds of Orthodox Mormons, it's like, ah, God didn't do it. Like Matt, either Matt kind of messed up or his parents, or like maybe he was abused or, you know, maybe his dad was absent or his mom was over, you know, and they're, you know, whether it's, I don't want to pick on anyone, but like North Star, Ty Mansfield, there's a lot of rhetoric that tries without any psychological foundation to pin someone's gayness on parents messing up or parents doing things wrong or abuse or some type of moral failing on your part. And I'm sure you know about all that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I remember looking at like reading articles about that and like going through checklists, like, okay, I was not abused. Okay. My dad was very present. Okay. I feel like my parents love me. Okay. Like, like I'm like, I'm constantly and it's checking. Like, well, just... didn't do enough sports. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a self-fulfilling <laughs> prophecy because if yeah. your personality, your given personality yeah. from childhood is that you don't like sports, well, then they can say, well, he didn't do enough sports. If you had done more sports, then, right? And isn't there a perception from the church, Kyle? We were talking before about a leaked audio from Elder Oaks, right? That's probably on the record on your on your PDF, right? It I've been is. saying, like, nobody label yourself as anything LGBTQ because you don't know yet. You might be able to undo it. So maybe that's in the mind of a believing Mormon, I'm guessing. They're just projecting, like... I'm disagreeing that your label is accurate. You don't know yourself well enough because my interpretation of the God that I believe in would never ever send somebody to earth making a mistake, making them queer whatsoever. So just wash off that label. That's kind of the rhetoric that the Oaks was kind of projecting um, onto quite yeah. honestly, and this is 13% of whatever the BYU population, they just need to wash it away. Yeah, and this is so fascinating because um, there are multiple levels of messaging there, there is the messaging that comes from 50 East North Temple through a general conference pulpit. There is a level of messaging that comes across a pulpit in a ward building in Richfield, Utah. There is a message that is uh, promulgated across the kitchen table in wards and homes across Zion. 
there is this messaging that Kara is speaking about uh, of a general authority. And we're not talking about 20 years ago. We're talking about right before COVID where Elder Oaks goes into a youth fireside and says, don't come out. Don't put a label on yourself. Don't qualify, classify, or give yourself anything because you could change. Your sexuality could change. You could get into a mixed orientation marriage. And why diminish yourself? Why uh, degrade that? Uh, w degrade yourself with a label like I'm gay or I'm lesbian if there is a chance for you to obtain the full effect of the atonement. And I think it was also interesting that in that very meeting, Oaks does come up and say, I hope this is not recorded because I don't want this to get out because people will twist my words. So it's all these different levels also, of- Bednar's, you want to mention Bednar's comment? And I think Bednar's comment is another great tell, one that ties- who don't know. That ties into um, the, the Fisher story at BYU with the Fisher suicide. Uh, the very next day, Bednar comes out and says, there are no homosexuals in the church. And it wasn't that we were erasing the homosexual identity within the church. He's saying, don't label yourself. You're only sons or daughters of God. You are not gay, straight, lesbian, uh, bisexual, or transgender. This is the mixed messaging that we're speaking of. And if, if run-of-the-mill, um, orthodox, or uh, centric Latter-day Saints are confused about this topic, then very far left, very right uh, Latter-day Saints are polarized, and if it's not coming directly from the top, and Bishop Roulette or stake presidents or elders quorum presidents or young men and young women leaders who are coming up with their own versions of the doctrine based on their uh, uh, adjacency to someone who identifies along this spectrum. Or the if, miracle forgiveness is lying around the house or the bishop's uh, office, right? Uh, undoubtedly. Then where is the common uh, messaging coming from? And that is the largest problem in Mormonism, is there is not common messaging. Uh, how is it that one day we can have a uh, a, a Ballard or a gong or a cook say nice, pleasant things about uh, a member of the LGBTQ community, and then a Tad Callister come out the very next week and say, if you are a supporter of the LGBTQ community or part of that community, you are a ticking time bomb. There is just this mixed messaging that speaks to exactly what Matt is, is talking about. How is it that you find direction on a compass that is constantly spinning in terms of this topic? And it gives us a whiplash. I mean, I just like constantly feeling, you know, like I can't, like I can't keep up. You know, I'm just being thrashed around, and and it's it's really hard. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So so during my second year at BYU, obviously being in this therapy group, um, helped me sort of open my perspective. Um. That that maybe there isn't just one way to live my life. Maybe there are a couple different uh, options for me. And you know, I signed up for the therapy group the next semester, so I did it for a whole year. Um, and during that time, I was like, okay, you know what? I've given so much of my life, uh, to the fullness of the gospel, to believing it wholeheartedly. Um, but now I've kissed a boy, I'm meeting other gay people like myself, and it's not as evil as I've been taught and told. Mm -hmm. So I sort of had this moment where I thought, okay, well, you know what? If Mormonism is not true, I want to find out and know because, because if there's any way that this isn't true, then then that will help me be able to live the life that I want to. Um, and so my my second year at BYU is when I read the CES letter. Mm. Um, when I started, um, what year is this? Uh, this let's see, it was my sophomore year of college, so that would be 2016, 2017. Okay, so four years ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, to be completely honest, I don't think I was quite ready to address that stuff. I I read the CES letter and left just a pretty nasty feeling inside of me where I, I felt, you know, a lot of cognitive dissonance, a lot of, uh, un I felt very uncomfortable. And so I thought, you know what? Okay, I'm just going to put this aside. This is maybe not the time for me to explore this. And uh, I'm okay with that. And so I think that while my faith at that point at BYU. Because uh, that, that's not going to help you at BYU at all. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the, yeah. Losing your faith on top of being gay at BYU, not a good not a good recipe for success at BYU. So you're trying to tell me the CES letter isn't required reading? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it should be. I don't, not, think, but, so. I don't think so. Um, but, yeah, but yeah, so I guess um, there were like doubts in my mind, but they they weren't more powerful than, than like the connection and the feeling that I still had with my faith. Uh, so I continued going to church, continued praying, um, maybe read my scriptures a little bit less, worked on my scrupulosity, but but still very much believed and participated. However, I did start dating. 
Ooh, yes. at BYU. At, at dating BYU. men. Dating men. Dating men. Yes, yes. Which um, I I haven't talked about a lot before, so I'm I'm kind of excited to get to share this part of my story. Um, but but I found you know it, it started just getting on like a dating app, and I would get on there you know one night that I'm feeling sad or alone or curious, and I noticed oh my gosh, like I recognize that boy from my class. Like oh I saw that guy walking on campus, and again the experience exposure that I got just from seeing these people where I realized like like there are tons of people just like me that I'm not alone and, and again it was sort of this learning that that by exposure and, and by understanding that there are more people like me that I felt less alone and I felt more empowered so I would download tinder you know look at profiles delete it like three hours later <laughs> then maybe like three three weeks later I would download it for a day then delete it and and sort of um, I don't know, slowly by slowly, I would start chatting with them and then delete it. And, and then, you know, eventually I, I think I, my first date, I met up with someone for, um, uh, like, like, uh, ice cream or something, I think in, in Orem and, um, <laughs> then feel so guilty just for meeting up with someone, even though, you know, a, a date is just like hanging out, you know, it, it's, but, um, can I ask another question? Cause yeah. so much of BYU's culture is dating and getting yes. married. So all your straight friends are going on an immense amount of dates, I'm sure. And are people starting to question, like, why aren't you dating? Or are people in your circle and your friends, like, they're noticing that you're not going on as many dates and you are just, like, you kind of just given up dating girls at this point? Like, what did that situation look like? Um, yes, yeah, so I actually um, continued dating girls as well. Um, not so much because I, I, I knew that I was not bisexual. So it's not that I, I was questioning if I was sexually attracted to women. It's more that I still wanted to keep up somewhat of an appearance. So mm. it wasn't f frequent, but it would be, you know, like my roommate would set me up with his his female friend and I'd go on a date with her. Or, or you know, I would still, when I wasn't on Tinder for for men, I would delete it and redownload it to match with women, you know. And, and so I was still trying to make it work, even while I'm exploring um, dating men. And I right. think downloading Timber, <clears throat> Tinder is incredibly vulnerable in that position because Tinder... There's no anonymity in Tinder. Right. And, and maybe this is jumping ahead or the part of the story you didn't want to talk about, but I would see most people in your situation jump to a grinder or an, an anonymous app like that first uh, to start the exploration. But, I mean, just props. I, I think that's great. Because that someone Tinder can tell on you, right? At BYU with the honor code, you you promise to report people if you find them breaking the rules. And so if your face is showing up on Tinder saying attracted to men, isn't that a huge it's risk? A, it's a great risk. And and that is associated with a Facebook profile. So the, the beauty of Tinder is that it's, it's verifiable that it, it, for the most part is for real. And, and what, and, and for the non Mormon listeners, what I don't think anybody really understands is once you sign that honor code at BYU, you're taking all these religion classes that aren't going to transfer to another university. Um, BYU has got weird classes and if the if BYU decides that you've broken one of the rules, they can kick you out immediately. And it can be literally for drinking coffee, drinking a beer, or even going on a date with a man. And then that can put you behind sometimes one to two years because you have to stop mid-semester. Then you got to go apply to other schools. Then you have to get in. Then a year or two of your studies don't even transfer. It can set you back tens of thousands of dollars and at least one to two years of your education, and it happens all the time. The, um, the current episode that I have on Latter-day Stories right now is a young man at BYU-Idaho who kissed another guy, and the young man was a year and a half into his uh, at school at BYU. Uh, the guy he kissed was in his senior year ready to graduate, and both were expelled for a kiss from BYU-Idaho, uh, exactly what you're speaking of. Their credits, uh, everything that they had worked hard for was removed. And, and that is that is the world that someone like a Matt lives under. Not and, to mention the, the shame of going home to your parents who are so proud of you to get into BYU and your siblings who are looking up to you and your ward members that all know that's where you went. And now you come home doing that shame walk of having been sent home. And again, these are the types of realities and or intrusive thoughts or fears that put people in, in these places where they feel like there's no escape that they, that, that then can lead to some of the suicidal ideation. Which is the reason why we have discussions just like this, because for so many Latter-day Saints, they don't think this world exists. And these are realities of queer people uh, within Mormonism. 
So back to Tinder. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, and I think to your point uh, earlier, Kyle, uh, the reason I think I chose Tinder over Grindr uh, is because because Grindr, um, I mean, it's it's pretty well known that that's a place where gay men go usually to find like hookups or or to have sexual experiences. Um, and so I knew that if like I got caught on Grindr, that that it's pretty damning evidence. But say if someone tried to turn me in on Tinder, saying, "Oh, like he's he matched with me or he swiped on me." First of all, they would also be having they would have to turn to themselves. And second of all, I think that I could easily say, oh, I must have just had my settings off or something like I'm on Tinder for women, but the program malfunctioned and showed me a man, you know. And so, and so I did feel like even though there was less anonymity, it, it was in many ways safer for me. Um, That's a great point. Yeah, it's a yeah. good save, Matt. The road, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> I'm going to have a very strongly worded message to this Tinder app that matched me with <laughs> men. <laughs> I'll be the first to complain to <laughs> Apple Corporation. <laughs> yeah, but, but but I mean, this is we come back to this theme a lot. We sometimes learn the, the rules within an, a high demand religion sometimes teach us to lie or to deceive. Absolutely. Because you get put in these boxes that don't fit who you are. And then you have this weird situation of a religion teaching you to lie to survive. And then the message of deceit is what we call exit strategy, where we have created these exits, just like you had prepared yourself to say, oh, it was a malfunction in, this is the bandwidth that we talked about earlier in this episode, the, the wasted energy, because we create those things. Matt had to sit down and say, I need an exit strategy for uh, this particular situation if it goes awry. And, and, and we're not talking about that word. We can, we can include that into the types of clothes we wear, the mannerisms that we, we showed in public, the, even the, the positions or places we found ourselves in public. We are constantly covering our tracks uh, in order to please a, a group of people that every member or mission president that, that are always watching us, watching our every move and criticizing and critiquing that. Because the church has hundreds of billions of dollars in the bank, access to the best mental health professionals in the world. They could come up with an explicit policy that says, hey, be you students who are gay. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can do. Here's how you meet each other. Here are the lines you can cross and not cross. Here's a way to feel safe so that you can explore whoever you are, whatever you are. Here are the rules so that you can still be happy, happy and healthy and not feel like you have to lie and do things in secret. But they keep it super ambiguous, super unclear making you feel unsafe and that you know by 2021 shouldn't the BYU leaders now know that they need to create a better environment for the students you know what I mean I hope we're getting there yeah yeah, yeah. I hope so too well, this leads to and holiday, I hope I that the the bigger context of this discussion is you know people asking on the the comments here a lot and you answered this before about why you went to BYU you thought it would be safe and then why stay why stay in the church in general and I hope that if you're comfortable either now or later just discussing the the wider context that this is sounds like the only way that you understood your place in the world is through being a son of God in this Mormon context this is how you uh, become straight you live a happy life the only path to success and happiness in the church is pretty much paved in front of you so you're going to lie you're going to uh, continue down this path that is full of just all of this this kind of trauma and toxicity for a higher and a greater good that you've been conditioned through your family and your upbringing to think is the only way to live a successful happy life is that yeah. that sound about right <laughs> so, Ab absolutely so where else are you gonna go really yeah yeah and I think uh, like again, I, I I know that I signed the honor code, and by getting on Tinder or by kissing a boy, I I, I broke the honor code. Um, but you know, I didn't sign up to be gay. I didn't sign up <laughs> to have these struggles, and so and you were promised it'd go away if you're righteous, exactly by a priesthood leader, exactly. And and so I think there is much more like nuance and gray area to to what I was feeling, and experiencing, and and also like. I really loved the academic rigor of BYU and I loved the campus. I mean, they like the moment a flower starts turning brown, they pull it out and plant in a brand new one. Like it is beautiful and people are so kind there, you know, and I remember, you know, walking around campus and you'll hear people scream, elder so-and-so or sister so -and, -so, and people run across campus to give each other big hugs and, and like in many ways, it's really beautiful. And I loved being there. I loved my professors. And, and so when I contemplated, oh, should I transfer? Um, well, academically, what would that mean? You know, I've, I've worked so hard to maintain my GPA, to work in these clubs. I'm going to have to give that all up. Um, financially, I was on full scholarship. I don't know if I can afford going to another school. And spiritually, 
I, I don't you know if I'm believed. ready to give that up. You still yeah. believed. Exactly. Where yeah. I'm like, if if I leave BYU, is this leaving my faith? And and I, I don't know if I can do that yet. And so, so it was just complicated. You know, I was just doing the best with, with what I had, and, and I didn't have a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my second year um, at BYU was was a lot better than my first in, in quite a bit of ways. And I also remember, you know, Tinder is not the only way that, that uh, you can meet queer people at BYU. Um, there's also USGA, which I think I went to uh, a couple times. But again, I was afraid of being recognized there. And um, kind of what I, I think is like the third way is just sort of or organic meeting. And there's kind of this like unspoken language, at least while I was at BYU, that, that queer people kind of have for each other. So, for example, I remember being in one of my political science classes and I saw this, this boy walk in and, um, you know, you can just kind of tell, oh, maybe he's queer or kind of gay. And so, like, throughout the class, we'd kind of look at each other, you know, and then, and then slowly in passing, it would kind of be like, uh, at some point, I'm like, are you, are you gay? You know, and, and it'd be like, yeah, are you gay? You know, and, and sort of this, like, quiet, um, like, uh, un undercurrent where you're just trying to find out who you can trust. And, and even then, you don't know if, if you can trust them. Are, are they going to be like a safe place? Or are they going to turn me in? And, and so during my second year at BYU, I was really lucky that I started slowly through these currents finding a group of friends that was really supportive. Um, one of my best friends, his name is Connor. He's also gay, and he went to BYU. So we met. We were at the same major, political science. And uh, so our, our first time hanging out, we made a pact. We said, you know, we really need gay friends who understand where we're at. Um, let's promise each other we're never going to date. We're not going to be romantic, but we need, like, a best friend that understand each other. And so from that point forward and throughout the rest of my time at BYU, um, I had Connor, who thankfully – um, you know, I could talk to and, and again, overcome that loneliness and, and have someone as a support. And, um, we also found a couple other friends in our program, some who were super active Mormon LDS, some who were kind of in the middle, um, another one who was queer, some of them were straight and, and sort of by forming this close knit group, um, was sort of how I, I got to come a little more into my own. Um, so, so yeah, so also during that year, uh, my second semester of my second year, uh, is when I got my first boyfriend. Um, so I, what? I started, yeah, I started dating a boy at BYU, uh, who was another student. Um, and in a lot of ways it was so fun. I felt like I was 14, you know, these experiences that, that, um, you know, people in my classes had when they were kids or, or teenagers, I was finally getting to experience at 22 years old. Um, and with it came, you know, a lot of emotional immaturity because I don't know how to handle relationships. Yeah. And then on top of that is this overwhelming fear that at any moment we could be caught and lose everything. <laughs> so I remember, um, you know, we would go to the student center, the, Wil the Wilkinson uh, Center, and we'd get lunch together and hold hands under the table. But we'd constantly be looking. And any time that someone would look our way, we'd have to pull our hands back. You know, and, and I remember um, just hanging out together and, and, you know, his roommate would question us, are you guys gay? And he would say, if you're gay, I'm going to turn you in because there are, there are BYU or kids who didn't get in who deserve to be here instead of some, you know, gay guys. And so there, there was this, again, just really hard because I felt like I was having this, like, honestly, like, innocent experience of getting to date for the first time, but it was overshadowed by this fear and anxiety and constantly feeling like I was being watched and, and that I was one step away from, from losing everything. Um, so we dated not very long. Uh, it was a great experience, but by the end of the semester, you know, I wasn't dating him anymore. And, and um, that was the only time that, that I, you know, had a boyfriend while I was at BYU. I, I continued to date off and on, but uh, I think the anxiety was just too much. I really couldn't keep doing, doing something like that. Um, and so also... So after my second year, um, I'm slowly starting to experiment a bit more. And over that summer, uh, my friend and I were in an airport. Um, this time we were in India. So, I mean, I guess maybe there's something about me going abroad that maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe Makes you feel safe. <laughs> that makes me feel safe. Thank you. Yeah. So we're at some <laughs> airport and we're like, I remember just kind of feeling, you know, kissing a boy, dating a boy wasn't as bad as what I'd been taught. It was actually like pretty great. And so it made me wonder what other things have I been, have, has there been a hedge put around that actually aren't as bad as, as I've been taught. And so we're at this airport and we decided to try some alcohol. 
Um, so I, so I had uh, a drink there at this airport with my friend. Um, we had a drink, uh, didn't think much of it. And, and she and I didn't drink together again. And, um, fast forward like 10 months later. So this is now my third year at BYU. Um, and she comes up to me and she says, Matt, you know what we did at the airport? Uh, this, this is in like February or March. So it's almost been a year now at this point. Um, she says, I want you to know that I still feel really guilty about this. And I went to my bishop and I told him, and he said that I have to go turn myself into the honor code and I have to turn you in as well. Um, and so in that moment, I realized, oh my gosh, one of my biggest fears, I'm getting turned into the honor code uh, for drinking. But then also I realized, you know, if they open any sort of investigation, I could be putting myself at greater risk if they find out that I'm gay or if some of my friends who are also gay, they connect and they, they accuse, you know, them of doing something uh, where suddenly I felt like my, my entire like community and network was at risk. Um, so that was, that was pretty freaky. Uh, so I, I went into the honor code and I turned myself in because I thought, you know, better they don't open an investigation. I just come clean. Uh, so I get a message from uh, the, the honor code counselor that I was to meet with. And so I Google searched her name, uh, obviously, before I started. And um, uh, the first thing that popped up when I searched her name was an article that she had written for The Universe, which is the campus newspaper. Um, and this article, she's talking about how she had a friend that she really, really loved. Um, you know, they were great, great pals. And that that friend uh, confided in her and came out as gay. And that she felt even though she loved her friend so much that the right thing to do to honor her covenants would be to cut that friend out of her life. And so this article that I read from this honor code counselor I'm about to meet with um, is I'm getting this feedback that, that she's willing to cut people that she loves out of her life if they're gay. And again, I felt incredibly unsafe where I thought if this counselor even finds out that I'm gay, um, she'll she'll take the harshest road possible the harshest punishment you know and and again just just shows how how easy it is to feel unsafe and and fearful at BYU um so i so i get to the honor code office and there are signs everywhere in this office that say no recording absolutely no recording you know there's signs that say like if if you if you're caught recording taking photos using a camera uh, you will automatically get the worst punishment possible and so i'm sitting in this office like oh my gosh this is so scary like what do they have to hide that i can't film something that they're afraid that you know they get exposed and and so i go into this meeting with this um with this, with this woman and, and we talk about what happened and I get put on uh, honor code probation. Um, and so I thought just briefly, I can t talk a, a little bit about what that's like. Um, for, for one drink of alcohol, I had to um, meet with my bishop weekly for six months. Uh, I was put on academic probation. So anytime I wanted to add a class, I'd have to call the honor code office and they add it for me. Um, I had to, they recommended I go see a therapist. So I had to go start seeing a therapist. Um, I had to meet with my counselor uh, every month to check in. I had to keep a daily scripture journal. I had to watch devotional every single day and write a report on it. <laughs> Holy I had to give three hours of service every single week and get them signed off. Um, I mean, it was so intense. It, it was like a, like a four credit class for six months that I had to do. And, and during this time I um, interned at the United Nations in Switzerland but I had to keep doing this stuff. So, you know, while my other interns would go to Paris for the weekend, you know, I'd, I'd have to go to church and, and make sure at the UN I'd have to get people to sign off on my, my hours of service. And, and I guess I'm bringing this up all to say not that, not that I'm, I'm like I, I, I am accepting the punishment that I got, um, but I don't think that it had the same effect that they thought. I mean, it, it made me uh, kind of resent uh, what they were forcing me to do and, and if their purpose was trying to reconnect me with God, I felt like it was pushing me further away. Uh, and, that, and that was hard to reconcile. And because hard. it was too uh, it was controlling kind of to... A little humiliating too. Um, uh, yeah, controlling, humiliating, um, embarrassing. Yeah. Well, and one of, the user, or one of the people watching this just said, and we pay our tithing for this. Yeah. And I think that's a really great point. Latter-day Saints... Your tithing money is going to pay counselors and honor code office officers and uh, these people within this office to monitor a single drink of a Moscow mule 
which ruins your life for six to eight months in, in terms of, I mean, this is just to me over the top crazy. Yeah. And I could hear Orthodox, you know, members saying, well, you sign the honor code right. and a lot of people want to go to BYU. And if you can't obey the rules, then you deserve whatever punishments they give because other people can just jump right in and fill your place. I can see people. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting to people who say that I, I usually like to respond by saying, um, you know, I went and saw my Bishop right as this was happening. I'm like, geez, I've got to go talk to him. And so I drive out to his house, um, and I talk to him and I'm like, Bishop, there's something I really got to talk about with you. Um, and he's all serious. And I'm like, I had a, a drink at an airport with, with one of my friends and he looks at me and he says, why are you coming to talk to tell me about that? He's like, this is not a big deal at all. He's like, you know, this, this, I wouldn't even stop you from taking the sacrament if you told me this. Like, this is such a non-issue. <laughs> wow. And it just shows me, I, how could my ecclesiastical leader, who, I, who we believe is called of God to receive revelation for me, is telling me that I am A-OK -okay in this category, that, that I am right with God and Jesus, but then this a academic institution is giving me... Bureaucrat, basically. This, yeah, bureaucracy is, is, yeah. is giving me all of this work to prove that I have repented. And in the same token, the feedback I got from my bishop was worlds different than the feedback my friend got from her bishop. And, and so, you know, people talk about this game of bishop roulette or, or needing to, you know, if you just go to a church, you know, the next city over is actually really accepting and it's going to be awesome. You know, I think my, my physical location should not determine whether or not I'm going to be safe or okay. Um, you, you know, and I, I don't... I don't want to have to choose where I live just so that I get a bishop who's um, not going to try to get me expelled from BYU. You know, it's just, it's, it's complicated, you know, and, and I'm getting conflicting messages from my leaders and, and all in the name of, of faith and of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, Who drank wine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think maybe the other part of this, the discussion that we haven't brought up is what did Matt think? Because in a church that's so heavily influenced by personal revelation, you have all of these uh, differing opinions that are telling you what you should think. How did that relate to Matt's personal revelation? What did Matt think about Matt? Yeah, and I, I want you to answer that, but I just want to make clear. Jesus drank wine. Joseph Smith drank wine the night before he was killed. Like many of the early prophets and revelators of our church drank beer, drank wine. It was just a 20th century sort of change where the word of wisdom went from being a recommendation to an actual requirement. Yeah. So, you know, the fact that you're getting punished for something that Joseph Smith and Jesus did is, I mean, it's obviously a little bit weird, but yes, to, to Kyle's question. I mean, uh, my first thought was, you know, I've already committed one of the greatest sins of all by kissing a man. And so, you know, the only worst thing I could do is mm. what murder somebody and then deny God in front of me. And so I'm like, you know, drinking is, is several steps down on, on right. the, the sin uh, spectrum, at least yeah. for me, that's how I felt. So yeah, I didn't feel particularly guilty or bad about what I had done. Um, Cause you were already kind of fallen in your own eyes a little bit. Well, we're also talking about so. nearly a year later. So it wasn't that it was this wasn't a fresh sin. This was, I, I mean, you, you're bringing back an old wound. Essentially, you're looking at scar tissue yeah. and analyzing scar tissue and just remembering the day that that happened. And for most of us, we would just move on from that experience. Right. Um, and, and what's interesting, too, is uh, my counselor had told me that um, typically just for one drink, they probably would have just given me a warning or something. But because I was an endowed student, that my punishment was going to be harsher. And so again, I sort of got this message that our students, even though we've all agreed to the same code, we're being held to different standards. And I couldn't help but feel like that's so representative of how I feel as a queer person, that I'm, again, held to a different standard than, than my straight um, colleagues. So yeah, anyhow, that's, that's kind of um, the, the biggest, I guess, points uh, throughout my BYU career until I get to my senior year. Um, where, you know, I decided just to focus in on my academics. You know, I, it's when I first started thinking, hmm, maybe I want to go get a PhD, which I've now just started. Uh, so I really um, just put my energy and effort into working with my professors. And uh, the time comes around near the end of my senior year where we can uh, send in applications to be valedictorian. Um, so every single department gets to choose a valedictorian. So for my college, the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences, 
uh, there was, I don't know, seven, eight, nine uh, valedictorians. There's one for political science, sociology, psychology. And, um, so for my department, the way it works is you have to be in like the top 5% uh, of your GPA does. So, you know, I had a 4.0, so I was in the top GPA. And then you also have to submit um, your extracurricular activities. So internships you've done, professors you've worked with, research you've completed. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty tough uh, position to, to, to receive. Um, so I got, I sent in my application and a couple weeks later I got, uh, the email back saying that I'd been selected as the valedictorian, um, which was so exciting. You know, for I the college for, uh, or for, your for my department, okay, okay. yes, for my department, um, which was super exciting because, you know, I'd, I'd worked so hard and, and to kind of get this positive feedback showing, yes, I've, I've accomplished something really, really great and really awesome. Despite the fact that I've gone through um, the hardest challenges in my life up to this point. Um, so even though there's, uh, uh, you know, half dozen valedictorians, uh, the way that the college ceremony works, the commencement, there's only one valedictorian speaker. And then there's one valedictorian who gives a musical number. And then I think a valedictorian gives the opening prayer and a closing prayer. So they try to get us all to participate, uh, but it's not guaranteed uh, what position we can um, participate in. Uh, so we all went up to the dean's office and we did little interviews, all the valedictorians. Um, and I was kind of surprised when I got the email back saying that I'd been chosen to be the graduation speaker. And so that's where I got to be the one who would speak for and on behalf of um, my college, the valedictorians, and all the students who were graduating. Um, so a super great honor and also a little intimidating. And I remember when I got that email in a way that I honestly can only describe as inspiration is I got this thought where, oh, maybe I should come out in my speech. Um, it didn't come from someone trying to push an agenda on me or like a queer club who was trying to say, you know, let's make a big scene. It's, it's what I believe was, was my heavenly father telling me that there's a chance for me to do a lot of good. Um, and so I kind of pondered, thought about this for a couple of days and, um, I think that I was motivated as well, uh, because I thought once I graduate BYU, if I don't come out soon, am I ever going to come out or am I going to be forever in the closet? You know, I was, I was preparing to move to Salt Lake to work at a data analytics firm. And I thought, you know, am I just going to keep living this sort of double life? Am I just going to keep crafting myself in the way that I think people want me to be? Um, and I thought I didn't. And so maybe if I came out this way, uh, you know, there's no taking it back. There's no going back in the closet. And, and I think that was kind of appealing to me. Um, so the next step that I did is I researched every single valedictorian speech that I could find. I mean, I listened to dozens and dozens on YouTube, uh, famous ones at big colleges, every single BYU one that I could find. I mean, I, I really did my research about what was appropriate rhetoric. What, uh, stories do people typically tell? How, what is the length? Um, you know, I'm an, I'm an English minor, and so I actually really enjoyed this part. Uh, but, but I really took my time to make sure that I was intentional in the things that I was going to say. Um, so after a bunch of drafts, um, I'm working through it, uh, trying to figure out the best place to put in that I'm proud to be a gay son of God, making sure that I share my testimony of Jesus Christ, and making sure that, that I acknowledge other students who maybe aren't like me so that everyone can feel included and accepted. Um, like, like, I really... Um, I'm, I'm proud of the work that I put into this speech. Um, and uh, I was also told that I needed to get it approved two weeks in advance by the dean's office. So I'm working on this. And then two weeks before graduation comes around, I send my speech in. And kind of in my mind, I thought, okay, I know I want to come out this way. But I also know that some people, no matter what, are going to perceive it as agenda pushing or polarizing or political. Um, so that's, that's the dean's job, the, approv the approver's job to see if it's, it's good or bad. Um, so I'm going to let them uh, choose their verdict and I'm going to follow whatever they say. So I made the decision, you know, if they tell me that I shouldn't say that in my speech, I'm not going to say it. You know, I'm not going to go against them. But I also thought, you know, I want to make sure that they don't just skim my, my uh, speech and they maybe miss the one line where I talk about being gay. And so before I sent the document in, I made little notes off to the side. 
So for example, at the beginning I said, you know, I want to include all these people because we're all part of the gospel choir. And believe it or not, I quoted Elder Holland's talk. And Mm -hmm. when I came out, I cited Elder Ballard, who said that we needed to understand and empathize with our, the experience of our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. Um, You know, and then I made sure that they know I, I want to bring it back so that people see their own struggles or their own triumphs and that they can feel, uh, their, their own love of Jesus Christ and, and Jesus Christ's love for them. Um, so I made all these annotations because I just felt like I had to cover all my bases. And I send in the speech, kind of say a little prayer, like, you know, Jesus, take the wheel. Whatever happens will happen. And uh, less than 24 hours later, I got an email back from one of the associate deans who said, Matt, I've read your speech. Thank you for all the annotations. So he acknowledged that he'd seen my notes. He said, I think it's, it's a perfect speech. I loved it. I think it will be great. Uh, and a great venue for it. Um, so at that moment, I realized I'd done everything that I felt I was supposed to. I'd made sure that I got all the approval that I needed. And now I was like, oh, oh shoot. Now I've actually got to come out this way. Can I ask you one question about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I can hear kind of an Orthodox Mormon saying, you know, a, a BYU valedictorian doesn't talk about their heterosexuality. They're not going to come out as heterosexual. So why would why is your sexuality even on the table? Uh, what was your, what's your agenda? What are you trying to do? Why would you? And again, these are a fictitious person's questions or thoughts. Why would you pollute a, a speech or make it political or a, try to advance some sort of agenda when that it's about it's about BYU, it's about the church, it's about education, it's about celebrating you know people graduating. Why are you even talking about sexuality? Clearly, John hasn't read the comment section of any of the media going on right now. <laughs> These fictitious people who would say, why? Yeah. <laughs> that, I think that's a super valid question because every faith-affirming comment section that I've read is asking that question. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I thought back to my freshman year, and I thought back to Harry Fisher and and how alone I felt. And I thought about how undoubtedly there were other queer students who were freshmen at BYU right then who were feeling just as isolated as I did and probably who were looking around and seeing that the only people like them were the ones taking their lot, you know, that were, that were pushed and forced uh, to, to, to suicidal thoughts. And, and so and I that thought... that representation thing you said, too. Exactly. Yeah. I thought, you know what? I am in a place where I can show other queer people like myself that we can be the valedictorian. <laughs> you know, that, that not only... Can we like, like be tolerated at BYU, but we are needed at BYU. You know, that the professors need our ideas and our research and our comments and that our community needs our creativity and our ideas and, and that we can be successful. That just because we are gay doesn't mean that we are doomed to a subpar life. So I thought, you know what? Yes, I want other students like me to see that and feel that. And I want there to be for maybe the first time in a long time, a, a positive narrative about a, a queer student at BYU. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So I didn't go to BYU, and you are hot on the scene at BYU, valedictorian in the groups. You would know the answer to this question. You mentioned earlier that one person a year of your time there that was queer um, ended their life in one way or another. Um, so I'm. It sounds like what you said is that by being inclusive and, and coming out during your speech – was a way to be vocal that you exist at BYU and to give a voice to other people. Um, If that saves one life of somebody at BYU, uh, I think it's worth it. I think you would think it's worth it. Has there ever been anyone at BYU who has ever ended their life because somebody came out at BYU? Because somebody felt like their religious freedom, their their right to have a valedictorian speech that didn't have anything to do with anyone's sexuality. Has anyone ever has anyone ever uh, like gone into a long depressive episode right. because of somebody doing that? You're kind of saying downside versus upside. The downside versus upside, no question. <laughs> so, uh, so you were on BYU. Is that <laughs> is, um, that, is that even an issue? You were getting emotional Come when on. she was I asking know. the question. What were you thinking? Uh, yeah. What were you feeling? I was thinking that, um, you know, the way that I've come out, I've, I've received a lot of love, but I've also received a lot of hate. Um, and, and especially from people I love, from family members, from my mission president, from people I really care about. Um, but I really believe that I will take that heat and those negative comments 
for the rest of my life if that means that one less person takes their life. So worth it to me. It is so worth it to me. And and I hope, um, and, and in fact, people have reached out to me and said that that because of the things that I shared at my speech that that it saved them at least for another day. And that's awesome. That's what I that's that's the only agenda that I had. And and uh, and that's why I'm proud of it and, and I'm grateful and that I did it. Yeah. Um <laughs> anything else about before versus after or did you get everything you want to say about before the speech itself? Um or the day of, or anything. Yeah, I, I think I think that I did. Um, I guess one other thing to say. Were you shaking in your boots when you actually gave the talk? Oh, I was. I was. I was. My hands were so clammy. I was so nervous. But that's what I loved about the talk because you said I, I didn't ever plan on coming out to my graduating class. Yeah. And I would think that most of us didn't ever plan or know when that moment was going to be. But under the umbrella of the Marriott Center with ten thousand people, um, family and friends and friend and foe, such an enormous opportunity. But also a lot of courage. Thank That's you. a lot of courage. Yeah, and um, to be honest, the response that I got immediately in, in the graduation arena was not at all what I expected. I, I had prepared myself to say people are gonna like, there's gonna be crickets or maybe people will boo, who knows, but but I'm, I'm ready for whatever comes my way. And yet when I came out, um, at least on my end, I felt just applause. You know, there was applause. There was cheering. There, was, I felt it at the end or when you said it. Right when I said it, I'm oh, proud really? to be a gay son of God. There was there were there were cheers. I mean, um, yeah, my cousins who were here. They they were there as well, and and I think they can speak to that. That people were cheering. People were excited that I shared this. Were they the filmmakers? Um, no, my sister was. Yeah, no, there's, um, I do remember the night before I gave my speech. I really, I honestly did not think that that it would kind of blow up the way that it did. Um, I thought, you know, some people on on Twitter, the Desnat community is probably going to get mad at me or, you know, call me a slur or something. And, um, you know, progressive progmos on Twitter are going to like it, but but that's about where it will end. Um, so I met up with my cousin, Brett, the one who, you know, has, has been helping me through my through my uh, journey. Comment section loves Brett. Everyone wants a Brett. We love <laughs> Brett. Um, and, and so I read my speech to Brett and I'm like, Brett. I want you to know I'm going to be doing this. Um, I'm going to need you the next couple of days as grandma and grandpa find out. And, and I don't know how our family's going to react. And, and of course, Brett was like, yeah, I'm there for you hundred percent. And, and he kind of looked at me the night before and he says, Matt, you know, like this could go viral. And I was like, Brett, you, you have, you have like way too much, um, <laughs> uh, faith in, in like my abilities. Like this is not going to happen. Um, so like, I really honestly did not believe that it would kind of take off the way that it did. And it wasn't until the night after I gave my graduation speech that things um, started getting a little crazy. And, um, uh, you know, it started with an article that uh, BCC, By Common Consent, uh, which is a, a popular, like, progressive Mormon blog, they wrote an article about me. And then within 24 hours, I was getting reporters calling me every 15 minutes. They showed up to my parents' house. They were calling my family, um, you know, in like the Midwest. The Trib, Desert News. The Trib, Desert News, yeah. Um, First, it was all local um, local papers, and then by the beginning of the next week, it was all uh, national. Associated Press. Associated Press, New York Times, Washington Post, <laughs> um, which was exciting, but also super scary because uh, I don't I, I don't know if, if you're aware, but uh, you don't actually receive um, your diploma when you graduate. It takes about mm. six weeks to get mailed to you. Mm -hmm. And I'd heard stories before about people who – uh, came out or who showed that they had broken the honor code after they graduated, but before they got their diploma and their diploma got held, you know, and they never received it. And so here I am talking to reporters and I feel this immense responsibility to be very careful about what I say, first and foremost, because I don't want to lose my degree. You know, I've worked four years um, to, to become valedictorian. This is something I, I'm not going to be able to replicate anywhere else. And, and I don't want to lose that work. Um, but then also I felt like I, I had to toe this line where suddenly I was being asked by some reporters to bash on the LDS church and the community that raised me. Um, but then other reporters asked me to bash um, the LGBTQ community and to say that gay people can be perfectly happy in the church. And I don't know if that was my experience. No, I do know it was not my experience. Um, and, and so th again, there's this still immense pressure of feeling like 
I had to be a certain way and I had to present a certain way and I had to be very careful in what I said um, because I still wasn't safe. Um, so anyhow, I, I start um, g giving more interviews, um, went on a podcast or two, and then um, it, uh, the social media response was kind of so overwhelming, um, both positive and negative, that I thought, okay, I got to check out of this. And so um, called up my friend Connor from earlier and another friend, Samantha, and I said, all right, you guys are going to be my PR people. So I gave them all my logins. I gave them my email. I said, I am not going to respond to anyone. You guys just do that for me. And they did, which I'm so grateful for. So anyone who ever goes viral or kind of gets caught up in some controversy, mm -hmm. that's my biggest recommendation is find some people to help um, monitor your social media for you so you don't have to. Um, cause I think that really saved my mental health. Um, so they're, you know, replying, setting up interviews with me. They're deleting mean comments from my Instagram so I don't have to see them. Uh, and then, um, one morning, I think it was Monday morning, uh, Connor says, Matt, you've got an email from the Ellen show. And I was like, oh my gosh, what the, like, like the Ellen show. Um, and so it was, it was one of their producers and they say, Hey, can we get on a FaceTime? So I FaceTime her and she says, we've heard your story. We're super inspired by what you did. Um, we don't know if we want you on the show or maybe if we wanted to like, um, like film you locally and show it or just send you some swag or something. Um, so they, they had me do like a bunch of interviews, probably four or five. And I think they were kind of gauging to see, you know, can I talk in front of a crowd? Am I going to be weird or uncouth? And, um, uh, the whole time they're saying, we're not promising anything, but don't go on any other interviews, just kind of wait. Um, and so I'm, you know, I, I talked to Connor and I said, should I keep doing this? And he says, well, you know, what's, what's your purpose? What do you want to get out of this? And, and I thought, you know, I want as, as many people to hear, um, my story as, as, as possible, you know, and, and, and be uplifted by it. And he thought, well, you know, the Ellen show is probably a great place to do that. And so the next day, um, less than 24 hours later, they called me and said, Hey, can you go to the Salt Lake airport right now? And so I packed a bag, hopped on the airplane, and suddenly I was on the Ellen show, uh, which was, was such- it LA? Was it LA? In LA, yep. Okay. So flew out there. Um, they had like a limousine pick me up at the airport. I mean, it was so fun. It was so much fun. What's it like being on the Ellen show? I just want to hear it all. <laughs> it's always been a dream of mine. Um, I, uh, uh, me personally, I know that not everyone has had a great experience on the Ellen show, and, and I, I want to recognize that, but, but I had a great time. Um, they, you know, gave me a per diem for food and I felt like a celebrity and uh, they did. So they, they took me to the studio and they put me in um, uh, one of their waiting rooms. In fact, it was actually the waiting room where Taylor Swift got scared in. And so that was kind of cool. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm sitting in a chair Taylor Swift sat in. And um, they were very strict. They were like, you cannot leave your room. You know, if you go trying to talk to other celebrities out there or try to find Ellen, um, we're just going to cut your whole part. Uh, so I'm like, Yes, like I would be very obedient, stayed in this room. Obedient, and they, I'm good at this. I'm really good yes, at this. <laughs> yes. I've had a lot of practice. I mean, for the most part. But, uh, yes, so. Staying in a closet. <laughs> so, I'm like, I'm, I am a pro. Um, so they film uh, two shows at a time. So I was there for like four hours before my segment went on. Um, and during that time, a producer would come in and kind of say, here's the outline we want to do. Let's practice. Um so I kind of knew what I, what I was going to say, what I needed to say, uh, but I didn't meet Ellen beforehand. Um, so when my segment was ready, they take me backstage. And then when I'm walking on uh, and meeting her is the first time I'm really meeting her. Um, and it was, it was amazing. It was such a cool experience to, to feel um, people who I really admired and, and, and trailblazers for the LGBTQ community um, reach out to me with open arms. You know, it was, it, it was a better feeling than I ever could have imagined. Um, and it, honestly, I, I kind of blacked out during the interview. I don't remember what I said. So when I was watching it, when it came out a couple weeks later, I'm like, yeah, I don't even remember what I said to this response. And, um, that's all to say that, that it was really fun and really lovely. Um, and as soon as the segment was over, I give Ellen a hug. The producer comes, pulls me away. I get put in the car and I'm off to the airport. So it was, um, very quick experience. Um, but, but so much fun. I would have been so nervous. <laughs> yes, I was super nervous, super yeah, super nervous. Because it's national, international TV. Yeah, yeah, but um, of, of like-minded people, you have Ellen that had that same experience, and and she's been able to trailblaze for so many uh, LGBTQ people. So I, I just think that it's like, not even we, irony; it, it's just really a special experience to be able to meet a modern-day Harvey Milk in a way. 
<laughs> well, th- and how do you articulate to people who would assume that like, well, of course you came out for attention that like, look at all the viral six, like you got to go meet Ellen, that people do not have a good faith interpretation to what coming out meant to you yeah. at this speech. Did, did you have a lot of comments like that as well? Where it's like, oh, look at you, Mr. Celebrity now. Yeah, I, I had a, I had a couple of those. Um, and I, and I struggled with that because I also felt um, quite a bit of imposter syndrome because um, I'm the first to say that there are other students who have worked way harder than I have for way longer to make changes at BYU, who have gone through a lot of institutional pain and, and personal price. Um, so I sort of felt, I was like, okay, I came out of my graduation speech, but but I don't think that I deserve this platform in the same way. You know, like, like these other students, um, you know, for example, uh, Addison Jenkins, who was the previous USGA president. I mean, he is, he has devoted so much of his time, um, that, that I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know if I should really be in this situation. Um, uh, but you know, again, Brett, going back to him, another shout out, he told me, um, like, like, no, Matt, you, you don't have to feel guilty because this this was meant to be this was your time to do what you did and um there's a reason why it happened this way we all have different purposes and callings in, in the way that we will help but i believe um the work roll forth and and this was just my part that that i was able to play and that's the brett that's right here the brett that's right, that's right here. here yeah brett, how, you spell your name with one t or two t's because there's a hashtag be like brett going on in the comments so uh-huh. there's a campaign two t's <laughs> two t's okay everyone yeah. get the spelling right be like brett <laughs> Okay, uh, I have to ask. So, of course, you know, Kyle and I, you know, was this 2017, 2018? What, what year 19. was this? It was 2019, yeah. It was two years ago, okay. It was two years ago. Yeah, of course, we heard almost immediately, holy crap, a BYU valedictorian during commencement came out as gay. And so we're like, you know, obviously we care and we're excited and we wonder what this type of thing means. I know I reached out to you and was like, come on, you know, you yeah. want to come on more stories? and. And I, Kyle, you probably did the same thing. Absolutely, and I. So we both we both felt where you were at, and also knew how inundated inundating that whole experience was. And I also, and I think John's kind of in this position too. Sometimes, sometimes I appreciate the interview when the storm settles, when things calm down, because that's where we get the real story. In, in my experience, in, in the heat of the moment, it is just frantic, and you're going from one spot to the next. But the beauty was in the later when when everything was calmed down a little bit and clearer minds, I guess, prevailed at that point. So, but we were we were rooting. We all were rooting for uh, this this great story. This was this was a fantastic story. And I always know there's sensitivities, but I always have to ask because I you know. But anyway, I'm sure it's hard to make that decision. Had you had, was your faith still fully intact by this point? And or had you listened to either Kyle's letter, gay stories, or Mormon stories by this point, or not yet? Um, yeah, I had I had listened to Mormon stories and um, latter gay stories a couple times before, so I was I was familiar with it. And um, to be completely honest, I remember getting um, the message from you, John, on Facebook, and um, you know Brett was the one that had introduced me to Mormon stories, and so I uh, wow, this this interview is something all about Brett. We got to get you up here, but um, <laughs> he. Uh, you know, I called him and I was like, should I do this? And he's like, well, just so you know, like it, it can be kind of polarizing, you know, and, and you should do what you feel comfortable, but. Definitely not before you get and, your degree. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's exactly Diploma. why, where, where I was still yeah. really scared. And I was worried that if I if I went on record somewhere and I said the wrong thing that, I, you know, I was still at risk. And so at that point, I didn't feel ready to share my authentic story. And and so in some ways, I know we're getting to it, but this past week is as tough as it's been, I feel like immensely grateful that there's a chance that I feel like I can reclaim my story and speak a little more authentically, you know, that I can share my story about my first kiss and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get kicked out of Berkeley for that, you know? And, and so, so in that way, thank you so much for, for having me on here again. It's, it's been great. And, um, was there any BYU administrative blowback, any negativity from church leaders, from BYU officials? Did you catch wind of any negativity after after the talk and or the public media firestorm or rainbow storm a uh, glitter storm that yeah. came after your the glitter storm. The, the, um, the media yeah no absolutely not i got oh it was all positive so much support from my professors from the administration um you know from my local bishop from my home ward that i grew up in 
Um, and I, uh, I, I'm sorry I have to tell the story a little bit vague just for privacy reasons, but um, one of my very best friends, um, her dad is involved in senior leadership in the Elias Church. <laughs> and so he expressed that, uh, you know, I was his daughter's best friend. And um, she told me that he had had a meeting with uh, the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and they told him to tell, uh, to tell my friend, who's sorry, to tell me um, that, that they were happy for me, that, that they were proud of me, and that they loved me. So that's validating. Huge. Absolutely. And so I remember, yeah, I was in tears telling my parents this because I'm like, can you believe that, first of all, that the, the apostles know my name? And second of all, that they took the time. Um, you know, obviously it's a he said, she said thing. So I can't verify for sure that they said this, but, but I feel pretty confident in saying that, you know, this message that I got was, was authentic and was real. Mm. Um, and so I'm getting this message where, where oh my gosh, I, I did it. I followed the rules. I did what was right. I followed my heart and I've helped the, the people that I've wanted to help. And um, I think the best part of coming out for me is that uh, I didn't know there was such a large community that was waiting for me with open arms, that there were so many people ready to love me. And, and I think that's one of the things that's, that's too bad as we talk about wanting to silence LGBTQ voices at BYU is, is when, is, is there's power and community and knowing that we're not alone and there's safety in that. And, you, you know, I, I got invited to speak at the Utah Pride Center and I remember feeling so overwhelmed when, you know, people who were ex-Mormon as, as well as like fully active Mormon were just there to embrace me and love me. And, um, you know, I got to march in the DC Pride Parade and the whole time I'm just crying because I, I could never have believed that thousands of people um, would be cheering for me because I was gay. You know, if anything, the image in my head would have been the opposite, you know, and, and so just knowing that my greatest fear um, didn't have to be a fear anymore, that it was replaced with just so much hope and so much love. I thought, gosh, every queer BYU student, every queer Mormon kid, every uh, LGBTQ kid in general deserves to have this feeling and should know that this feeling is available to us and it's out there. Um, and, and that people like you and, um, you know, other communities everywhere are ready to support and love us um, was just the greatest feeling in the world. And, and it's almost like, uh, it almost feels like the church never wants to like allow itself to have a great moment. It always wants to like destroy the good moment. Because I remember yeah. thinking in 2019, maybe you do too, like, wow, well played LDS church. You, That's right. You picked a valedictorian who was gay. Uh, you didn't negate his wonderful talk and then you got a great media sort of aftermath where everybody was saying whoa that's cool BYU's broken a barrier and wow and 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 after this was after of course the November 15 policy gets rescinded I was just going to say that April yeah. 2019 is when that policy was rescinded so the church already was they had a lot of capital banked there in terms of their favorability towards the LGBTQ community in terms of messaging and then I saw the same thing. I hear here was this valedictorian who made a great speech. And then the church picks up great political capital in the court of public opinion with Matt's story being shared on all of these news networks. And I thought, what's this, bigger than Ellen? This is a golden moment for uh, LGBTQ LDS Mormonism. It's like, well, maybe we're having a new era of openness and of right. progress progressivity, right? Or but interestingly enough, the people in the comment section says, but this is just mixed messaging again. They already know what they're, where the story is going. Mm. This is the mixed messaging back and forth between uh, the experience and the church. So I want to hear what happened in those two years, and I also just want to jump to Holland's talk. Because, I know, right? <laughs> so what, whatever you want to say about those two years between your talk in Holland, I guess COVID happened. But. Yeah, COVID happened. Um, yeah, uh, to be honest, after that, I ended up uh, going working on a political campaign, which is a great experience. Um, during that time, I was working seven days a week, you know, 90 hour work weeks. And so um, it, it was intense, but it also gave me a chance to, to step away from active church membership for a little bit. And I think that was that was really healthy for me. I needed a little bit of a break. Um, and then obviously when COVID happened, I moved back home with my parents and couldn't attend church um, in person. And, and so during that time is when I feel like I finally started to face some of that, those questions about my faith and started to go through a real faith transition uh, where, where I felt I was comfortable enough in, in my sexuality and who I am um, that I started to ask myself some of those hard questions. You know, I revisited the CES letter 
and um, also took a look at a lot of Mormon apologist websites and 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 tried to to see what I really believed. And um, to be honest, I'm still kind of going through that process. I think we say transition because it doesn't just happen overnight; it's a process. Um, but but I did receive a confirmation for myself that that God is happy with who I am. That 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 God made me the way I am um, for a reason, and that reason is is to be me. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of during my two years experience. Um, yeah, during that time, I still felt a lot of shame about being open ab about what I was doing, namely about you know dating men. Um, the reason why is is I did feel a lot of pressure because um, I, I felt like in some ways a lot of uh, LDS people and very faithful members would look at me and say, we love your gay identity. We love that you want to paint your nails and that you like Ariana Grande and we want to support you through all of that. And we are also so happy that you are a faithful, active member and that you're showing to kids that they can be, that they can be proud and Mormon and gay. And, and so I'm getting these messages and I feel this pressure to keep up that image because people are looking at me as, 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 you know, like a, as like a, a safety light. And, and if I expose myself as someone who is questioning and struggling with my own faith, I, I could do a lot of damage, and, and, I, and I don't want to do that. So I felt like in Especially some ways— the stakes are so high. Because the stakes are so high, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, my family, my parents are still very active LDS members, and I love them and respect them. And, 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 and so there's, again, this sort of um, tension or, or needing to— like wanting to respect and love them. And, and so I still kind of hid those parts of myself away. Um, so even, it's kind of crazy. Even after I came out, I still felt like in some ways I was in the closet. Um, so it actually was not until this year in February, um, my birthday's in February, where I got to a point, maybe it was quarantine, being stuck with my own thoughts all day, where I thought, you know, I've got I've to pull the bandaid off. I, I am done hiding any parts of myself. I want to live authentically and openly. And if people in my life aren't going to accept that, then the sooner I know the better so that I can move on and find someone who will be accepting. So on, on my birthday, I sat my parents down and I said, Mom and Dad, I am not sure if I'm LDS anymore. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Um, I'm going through a faith transition. I don't know if I believe the Joseph Smith story anymore. Um, and I just need you to love me. And if you're not going to love me, I need you to tell me. Um, and my parents are amazing. They said, Matt, of course we love you. We're going to love you no matter what. And they said, your, your journey is yours alone. My dad can't tell me what to believe or what not to believe. And he doesn't want to. You know, neither does my mom. And, and you know, I'm so grateful that they told me that. And I'm so sad that I waited so long to be open and honest. Um, but I understand why. I mean, it's so scary. Uh, but but I'm, I feel incredibly lucky to have supportive family and, and to have... Um, siblings and parents and cousins um, who want me just to be me. And that's all I want to be too. And I think that's an important part. You had really a second opportunity at another coming out. Yeah. And it was, it was beautiful in its simplicity. Some LGBT Mormons have told me that coming out as losing your faith inexplicably was actually harder for them than coming out as gay. Oh, 100% so. was my experience. Yeah. It says a lot, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Where where I I I felt like I was letting more people down, or or that it was you know more condemning because being gay, I I feel like it, at least the rhetoric that I've listened to over the past decade um has really changed. You know, people are starting to understand that that this is not something that we can electroshock away from us. Not a choice. Yeah, it's not a choice. It's not even a sin to have the feelings. Right. By modern, right. By modern rhetoric. Yes, and that some bishops might even say, you know, it's okay for me to kiss boys and to go on dates with boys. Um, but being faithful and staying in the church is a choice. And, and so that is where I think, at least for, in my experience, there's still sort of that pushback. And, and that's why saying that, you know, I've lost some of my faith uh, is, is just as hard, if not harder, than saying that I'm gay. I think that's uh, that's super honest, and I think that's a discussion that I hope the Latter-day Saints who are listening to this episode can grasp onto, that there is a reality that I didn't choose my sexuality, yeah. but I could choose my religion. And when we get to that point, 
some of the healthiest people that I've seen in this space are those who are able to separate the gospel of Jesus Christ from Mormonism. And that's maybe a subsection of this topic. But I didn't choose to be gay, but I could choose to be Mormon. And which one brought me the most amount of happiness and which one was most authentic to me? The one that I didn't choose, the one that was beautifully created and crafted for me. And so many gay uh, or queer Latter-day Saints who are able to find that. Trans. Uh, tra especially uh, our, our trans uh, community. When you find that, that's where the growth happens and that's where the beauty and, and the ability to finally shine and sometimes to use Mormon vernacular, that's where we're able to fulfill the measure of our creation. Mm. That's where we're, we're able to, to bloom and blossom uh, the very finest. Absolutely. And what a better validation than to get into a PhD program at UC Berkeley. Like, yeah. like that's not a shabby PhD, uh, political science program. I mean, it's one of the top in the country, right? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it is. And um, <laughs> it's exciting. You know, I also, um, I was so worried when I was applying to grad school because I hadn't fully come out yet that I would be running away from something, that I would be running away from being honest with my family. I'd be running away from, you know, um, the Mormon corridor. Uh, but once I chose to be open and honest, I now feel like I'm running towards something instead. And it's exciting. It's, it's fulfilling. And so being out in the Bay Area, you know, I'm excited to, to date, to, to meet other people and to finally start exploring um, and crafting the life that I want to live. And, you know, the two years since I've come out um, have been extremely restorative for me. And I feel like my mental health has never been in a better place. Uh, getting out of BYU, I didn't realize as soon as I got my diploma how much anxiety I had, I had put on myself and how getting that diploma just released me from that. And, and so I've, I've put in a lot of work with, with my therapist, with my community, with my family um, to, to feel better about myself. And, um, and I do, which is, which is great. It really does get better. And so I think that's why this past week, when on Monday morning, <laughs> I got this message about this talk where I'd been referenced. Um, tell, tell us, just take us through that kind of cinematically. Yeah. So, so you wake up. So I'm in California. I moved there uh, the beginning of August. So uh, kind of a new adjustment. I've been there a couple weeks. And last week was um, the first week of my first year of my PhD program. So there's already a lot on my plate and on my mind. You know, I've, I'm adjusting to classes and, 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 and learning the area. And so I wake up Monday morning and I get a message from uh, one of my friends on Twitter that just says, oh my gosh, Matt, I, I am so sorry about what was said today. I hope that you're in a place that it doesn't affect you anymore. But if it does, oh. I'm here for you and I love you. And I was like, Brett, what? Brett, where's Brett? Where, yeah, where, 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 where's Brett? Well, I was like, what? Like, like it. the last thing on my mind was something about me coming out. And so they mentioned there was some sort of devotional, which uh, later I found out was like a, a speech towards the BYU faculty. Um, and so I'm like, did they like call out gay people in general? Did they, you know, like what's going on? Um, and it wasn't until I'm reading uh, the remarks by Elder Holland and I get to the paragraph where he says, you know, if. Uh, I think yeah, I want to read yeah, it. Yeah, Can read I read it? it? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here is uh, Elder Holland's talk where the part where he talks about Matt. He, Elder Holland says, if a student commandeers a graduation podium intended to represent everyone getting diplomas in order to announce his personal sexual orientation, what might another speaker feel free to announce the next year until eventually anything goes? What might commencement come to mean or not mean if we push individual license over institutional dignity for very long. Oh, that's gross. Every, there's like 15 words in there I want to, I want to dissect. But what's your reaction? Like, yeah, I mean, I read those words and so commandeer. Let's just pick a couple words. Commandeer. <laughs> yeah. Let's do a rifle round. What do you think about that word? Uh, just you mean a musket round. Oh, I mean, thanks, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it felt like a like a gut punch first of all and second of all i i thought it was such a gross mere mischaracterization i mean like we we all know that elder holland is is a brilliant rhetorician i mean you know he, yale 
yeah, went to Yale. He got his you know English degree at BYU. I got my English minor at BYU. You know, we'd, like like I I know that he knows the impact of his words. Um, and I thought commandeering. That sounds like like I went off the rails and I said something that wasn't approved and I and I made it all about myself. And I and I was just crushed because I thought anyone like people have told me that before. Maybe not use the word commandeering. Uh, but everyone who said that I was selfish or I made it all about myself or I went off the rails without like uh, without exception, none of them actually listened to the talk. And so I hear this and I thought, did he even hear what I said? Did he even ask the dean's office that the of, of the College of Family, Home and Social Sciences? Like, like, I just thought he does not have the right information here. Um, and and he's he has misinformation and he's still calling me out in front of all these faculty who I love and support and, and and that I want to support me, you know, and, and getting a PhD, I want to go into academia. And so my second thought is, oh my gosh, are all these BYU professors that I'm co-authoring with and I want to work with in the future, am I going to be a pariah to them now? You know, and in just one single sentence, I felt like my reputation had been completely twisted. What about the power differential of a man, you know, for it's, the Mormon church in, in 2021 is, is close to a trillion dollar organization the first presidency of the Quorum of the Twelve are literally viewed as mouthpieces of and for God and Jesus. Mormons believe they speak to God and Jesus. And then just they they have followers of anywhere, you know, let's just say four to five million people across the world. And then all their power and money, it, it'd be like, you know, the president of the United States almost denouncing an individual. Like, what what was that like? Like, the power differential. Yeah, it was, um, uh, well, it, it just felt like I was being punched down on by someone who has infinitely more more power than I do, um, which makes it infinitely more, more hurtful, more, more painful. You know, it's one thing for um, my bishop to say something about me like that, but it's a whole other thing to, um, for, for someone whose like, picture is hanging on the wall at my family's house, you know, someone that that the people I care about raise their hand to the square and sustain. Um, and, and so in this moment, my first, my first fear is, oh my gosh, is my family going to have to choose between showing support for me and sustaining someone that they believe to be a prophet? And I thought, oh my gosh, this man, whether intentionally or not, with, with one single word is pitting people against me. You know, and, and, and I'm not confident that they would choose me because, because they love their faith and, and they're taught to sustain unequivocally, uh, unequivocally, yeah, no. um, the, you know, the leaders of the church. Uh, so it's scary again. And suddenly I feel like, uh, like someone, um, you know, is, is commandeering my experience and, and he's, um, dictating, you know, how people are going to react to me and, and how my relationships are going to be moving forward. Um, and Kyle, I mean, I, I felt like it was grossly inappropriate. 100%. And, and abusive. And I like, the, Matt, you're bringing up the fact that you felt as if Elder Holland was commandeering your experience. And I agree. We had that conversation when we uh, sat down and, and discussed uh, your valedictorian speech as opposed to what Holland was speaking of. And, and it was almost as if he was using... Um, and, and you brought that up, like he had misinformation and, and didn't fully, perhaps he didn't even listen to your speech. But we also contemplated or wondered, hypothecated whether or not he was using Matt as a way to get to the administration where he possibly was not able to do that in private channels, but in a very public setting was able to use Matt Easton as a bludgeon to say either, yes, I acknowledge the dean's office approved his speech, but let the let the record be clear. That'll never happen ever again. Yeah, that's interesting. And he brought that up, and I just saw that there were some correlations there. He 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 opened that speech with "I will go to my grave," and he he closed that speech with "I will go to my grave." Almost as if he had created a golden idol in BYU. That he had created this this idolization of the university, and it didn't matter who was crushed or who that university was founded upon that idol must remain solid and golden. And Matt at that point was just a, a cobblestone in order to ensure that that, that idol did not fall grist. over. How about grist for the mill? Grist for and the not mill, just yeah. Matt, I mean, it's not just Matt, right? It's the queer experiences of so many other BYU students. It is the 
past, present, and future. It is the uh, affirming and allyship of faculty and staff and, and parents and family members and other tithe payers who very well know where their tithing dollars are going, and that is to support a community that has been marginalized by the very institution that it's using to prop its golden idol. To me, it was just mind-boggling. And irresponsible and hurtful and... And commandeering. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, I, I, can, I can handle if people didn't like my speech or didn't think that it was the appropriate place. You know, and usually to them I say, okay, if you didn't think it was appropriate, you are more than welcome to become valedictorian and give your own speech. <laughs> you know, like, you are, you are welcome to put in that work, but, but I put in that work and I said what I felt was right. And I did it because I wanted to help queer students. And yet two years later after I've done that, I felt like in one single blow, the action that I had made to help queer students was now being weaponized to hurt them. That sucks. <laughs> it's, it's a terrible feeling because I thought, have I just made it worse for them? You know, have I just made it harder for the next gay valedictorian? Have I just made it harder for the next queer kid who just needs to see a rainbow flag on campus so that they're not going to continue having suicidal thoughts? You know, that, that is antithetical to whatever agenda I had or whatever goal that I had. And that just hurts so, so deeply. Yeah, because do, doesn't that send the message, don't come out? I mean, how, what, what other message can a gay BYU student or Don't label Mormon yourself. Kid? Don't, in, don't inflict yourself with that type of, there are no homosexuals in the church. It all leads to the same messaging, which is destructive and unnecessary. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so sorry that happened. So then there's the, then he goes on to just that whole thing, the slippery slope argument <laughs> that what are other people going to be announcing now? And will it be anything goes and what might just that use of kind of English rhetoric to say, what might commencement come to mean? Like, what is he insinuating? He's stealing is, it from Pat Robertson is, is from gonna, uh, whatever, 600 Club? What's it called? The 700 Club. 700 Club. Yeah. Matt Robertson used to call it, what's next, sex with ducks? <laughs> Just, like, throw out whatever you want to say. No, I mean, like, really, slope. what That's is what he, they go to. like, what, is, he's choosing those words. He's a smart guy. He chooses his words carefully. What is he envisioning there when he's saying, like, what's next? I wonder if this conversation, the conversation we have around this topic is not about Matt and not about the LGBTQ, QQ, LGBTQ community, but more about a discussion of control. We've lost the left. We've lost the right. Meaning LDS church leaders. Correct. At church headquarters. Okay. Controlling not, the, not only the LDS left, not only the LDS right, not only LDS centric, the, the middle ground, but our faculty and our staff and our media and the very students who are uh, academically surviving at BYU, the church must look at this circular merry-go-round and say to themselves, we have fallen off a long time ago. How do we stop it or how do we get on? And which section of this merry-go-round do we attack first? And, and I think this is a situation of control where the church has lost control uh, with with the, the myriad of different experiences that are happening. And, and just like you brought up earlier in the episode, Matt, all of the things that the church talked about and said about queer people, there is no happiness, there, is no, there are no spiritual experiences, there will be no success on this side of the aisle. Your lived experience proved that different. And that is the grand message that hurts Mormonism's message so much. And I think that's what most queer family members are seeing within within Mormonism today is that my son or daughter or non-binary child's experience does not match the rhetoric or the teachings that have come from the church. And how do we decipher this dogmatic approach now? How do we, how do we decide what is truth? And most Latter-day Saint families are siding with their son or their daughter or their child, and that is the control that's being lost in Mormonism. And unfortunately, again, I think you were just a product of them lashing out to try to, to, try to make that apparent. And, and I think that's what's sad, but the reality in this situation. I, yeah, I love that, Kyle. And I have a dear friend who will rename, remain nameless who made this analogy because he really loves BYU, and um, he's still a member, and he he compared it to the following. He said, it's kind of like the church is the Walt Disney Corporation, and BYU is Disneyland. 
And th- th- there's nothing, you know, you can have Disney movies, you can have Disney merchandise, but there's nothing that really reflects the Disney Corporation as much as the Disneyland experience. Mm. And BYU is the church's Disneyland. And if BYU is perceived to be kind of veering too much one way or the other, then the church risks a real damage to its flagship brand, you know, representation. And so what this represented was Elder Holland basically throwing you under the bus, throwing the LGBT community under the bus in an attempt to manage a, a, a brand that's kind of veering off course. But what a, you know, for, for, a, a, for a leader that claims to represent Christ, who would give the parable of the lost sheep and say, leave the 99 to go protect the one, it's kind of like he's taking what we all know to be the most marginalized, vulnerable population in Mormonism at this point, and using them, sacrificing them, throwing them under the bus into the grist mill so that he can make some sort of brand management, you know, uh, talking point sort of uh, commencement speech to save the brand. It, 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 it feels just so inappropriate and, and, and I think almost this, violent. I think the same Latter-day Saints who have questioned a lot of the, that we've discussed about in this episode uh, are also one of the strong arguments they've come out with is, well, he was speaking to the faculty and the staff. This wasn't a general Mormonism issue. And I say, using the Disneyland example, uh, metaphor, that is exactly what he needed to do. He needed to go to the, the characters that were out there on display, the Cinderella's, the, the Aladdin's, the characters that were out on the streets, and he needed to ensure that it, those who were experiencing Disneyland, who were there to see the characters, knew where the characters stood and were using the characters to control the, the people who were visiting and people who were there to enjoy the experience. That makes, that makes sense. Yeah, and let's be clear. As he likes to say about himself, he's not a dodo. He knew that this was going to be released on YouTube. He knew this was going to be seen worldwide. And he knew what message he was sending, not just to BYU faculty and staff, but to LGBTQ kids, to BYU faculty, to LGBTQ par- parents of LGBTQ kids, to ward members and bishops. It's basically saying, be very afraid to be too supportive of LGBTQ kids or to be LGBTQ or to come out as LGBTQ. And he knew, he knew he was doing that. And then to add to that, the the musket rhetoric, the friendly fire rhetoric, and then calling BYU professors and faculty to pick up muskets in defense. uh, It's just, and everybody says we're, we're misinterpreting them. We're giving a bad faith representation. I don't, I don't know. Am I? Why, what's your, I mean, what do you want to share, if anything, overall of just your assessment of that talk? Um, no, yeah, I, I think I see a lot of my very faithful friends on social media saying, you're taking it out of context, you're looking at pieces. And to that I say, no, I read the entire speech. I've listened to it multiple times. We've, we, we are... You've been to a pretty good school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're um, reading comprehension, A plus, Valvictorian levels. <laughs> I mean, I hope so. Um, uh, yeah, that that the, the power of rhetoric is real, a- a- and that you know how how are we not to interpret it this way is is kind of blowing my mind. You know, when when Elder Holland goes on later to say there is no one who has wept more or has cried more or or who has hurt and loves the LGBTQ community. To that, I say, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't feel that love. I don't. Feel, if if you have tears, look at my scars. You know, your your pain is is nothing compared to that of my community. And and how dare you say in the same in the same speech that you don't want us showing too much support. You don't want us speaking our truth in ways that are not against the gospel of Jesus Christ or or the doctrines of the church. But then also say that that you love us and that the world can be so cruel. Like, I'm sorry, my experience is that the world has embraced and has loved me. They're not the ones that have been cruel. Ken, and I just want to bring up one point because I ride along this discussion of tears. I sat up in bed the other night and I'm like, oh my gosh, the beginning of his speech started with, I cry at the opening of grocery stores. I cry at the ribbon cutting used of car. used car used, dealerships, yes. used so car weird. lots. And then he says, I've cried for the LGBTQ community. And I thought, for the just... That moment, it was so disingenuous to me because I love Elder Holland. There are so there are so many 
we both personally know the Hollands. There were so many moments there that I thought, that's so disingenuous. To cry, to, to boast about crying at a used car lot, the old grand opening of a used car lot, and then to compare those same tears to the ones that will never bring back some of my friends who completed suicide, to me was so disingenuous, and it was not the message that I would have expected from a special witness of Christ. The message that we've discussed here today, uh, he knows what he's saying, and and to me that was just, it, it ripped, it, it ripped, something inside of me broke uh, when I when I made that realization. Um, I, I do also want to say, um, I, I do want to address briefly some of the comments I've gotten uh, is that, you know, people think that maybe Elder Holland was sent to give a strongly worded message against the LGBTQ community um, because he's so loved and he's so like, like people perceive him as being more progressive or liberal or, or, or kind. And um, believe it or not, a, a couple months ago, I think it was in June, I actually went on a date with a guy who's one of his good friends is a very open, active, um, gay member of the church. And he's very personal, like close personal friends with Elder Holland. And so this, this boy on my date is telling me, um, oh yeah, actually when you came out, um, my, my friend who's close with Elder Holland told me that Elder Holland was livid, that he was very upset that you came out that way, that, that he called me selfish and, and that I was just making it all about myself. And so, I mean, just a couple months ago, I kind of, through the grapevine, got clued in that like, oh, maybe Elder Holland doesn't like me so much. You know, that's, that's a little weird, but um, then I just feel like when I heard this speech this week, it just reaffirmed that, that he's got some anger towards me. And I just want to tell him, you know, I'm part of your flock. I'm one of your sheep. You know, I've read all of your talks. I've, I've grown up in your church and you've never even met me. Um, but you sort of have this anger towards me, like, like a little bit upset. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's not, but, um, it, it hurt. Yeah. It was, it was mixed messaging again. One of the great talks that I remember from Elder Holland was, uh, his, his just amplified and beautiful message of suckering and running toward someone. He says, he talks about so often how the world, when they see someone in pain or peril, they run away from those people in their infirmities. But a true disciple of Christ and Christ himself suckers those people. He runs to them. Yeah. And I parallel that with what he, he spoke of at BYU. And that wasn't the Elder Holland suckering that I remember. That wasn't as a missionary serving a mission and teaching investigators that in the moments of your quiet despair and moments of uh, being uncomfortable and when the liberty jail moment happens, when everyone else is abandoning you, Christ will run toward you. I didn't see that. He, this was an opportunity to run away. Literally, those words were running away from Matt and asking others to run away just to me, it was, it was, uh, it hurt. There was a lot of pain there. Can I ask a question with that as well as uh, that's a perfect way to put it, that Christ to sucker. And uh, it hurts to know that Holland had a choice of whose type of letter could you possibly read at BYU? You could read a letter of somebody who suffered and ended their life over their, uh, like, you know, being part of the LGBTQ community, he could have read that and he could have said, I want to make this a campus where we, uh, you know, welcome these people, but he didn't. He read something from somebody who was probably a possible donor. And instead of running to sucker people who are on the margins, he ran to people who, let's <laughs> say, don't need quite as much suckering. So did that, did between the tears that he cried over, maybe we could call that performative since we're bringing in his own analogies of him crying over, you know, used car lots. Did, did that hurt to hear that he would say that he cried over something and then when he has an opportunity to say something to the staff over whose opinion matters a lot to him, it's somebody it's somebody's opinion who's telling you who not to associate, who not to advocate for. Instead of running to sucker people from the LGBTQ community, he did the exact opposite. Did that, how did that feel? Especially when we know that since 2008, there's been an epidemic of LGBTQ right. youth and adult it's suicide in Utah. Holland knows that. It was on HBO in the movie Believer. It's been in all the news channels and reports, the Trib and the Desert President News for Oates years and years and years. President Oates was asked that very question, and uh, 
do you believe the church is specifically responsible for? Uh, so during the, the November 2015 policy point, about 32 suicides that were documented specific to the November 2015 policy. And, and Oaks was asked specifically, do you bear any responsibility? He shrugged it and said, I would answer to a higher power. And that was his response to uh, 30 lives that were lost uh, at least. with the completion of suicide. Getting angry. At least. And yeah, and, and but that's up. the reality of why this discussion is super important and why words, especially from a special witness of Christ, matter. Because, again, if we want to talk about control and we want to talk about audiences, you have the Mormon left, the Mormon right, the Mormon center, and the Mormon adjacent who are all interested in seeing that people success, succeed and thrive. And this isn't thrive language. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think to answer your question, uh, Kara, I was absolutely stung uh, when, 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 I, when I realized that that's the letter that he chose. You know, um, I, I wrote a response um, to Elder Holland in the Salt Lake Tribune. Uh, which was published physically uh, this morning, but I, but I think Friday uh, it was published electronically, and and uh, I share that you know he's not the only one that's received letters um, and messages as well. And when I came out, I was inundated with hundreds of messages from queer struggling members of the church. Um, I got a message from a young man who was a student at BYU Idaho who had never come. I was the first person he came out to because he was so afraid that if he did, that his roommates would react with violence. He was afraid of getting physically hurt for simply saying that he was gay. I got another letter from a, a trans woman on the East Coast who said, who was contemplating suicide in that moment. She said, I really don't think there is a world in which I can be a trans woman and, and still exist and live. You know, and, and, and when I compare these letters that I'm getting to one where someone says, I'm, I'm hurt and confused that there are pride parades going on and, and rainbow colors. And Too much I, support. And, yeah, and I don't think I'm going to donate anymore, and I don't think my kids are going to go to your school anymore. I mean, sh sure, on its own, that could be a concern for an institution, but, but it is nowhere near as important as saving lives. And, and then, you know, I mean, I did a simple Google search for the endowment of, of BYU. I mean, it's a billion-dollar endowment. You know, is, is, are, are donations really more important than lives? I hope not. But that's the message that I feel like I'm getting. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so well, can I add one super important comment just yeah, to that? Please. You're talking about the comments you're getting. So many. I don't have time to read as many as I could. I'm going to start crying. Let's all just start crying right now because, oh, my gosh, I'm going to read this one. That said, after Holland's speech, I had a few days where I experienced severe suicidal ideation again. Then I watched your speech, Matt. And it didn't give me a re it did indeed give me a reason to keep going for another day. Thank you. So there's without question a lot of people suffering this week hearing these messages from somebody that again, but going back to is my family going to choose this religious leader's opinion of me over their own son or daughter or non-binary individual or whatever? Um, a lot of people I'm I'm sure are going through that, and even something that you did that was small and important for you and the people at BYU, that is still having these beautiful uh, ripple effects even to today that Holland can't touch. So Holland many can't people, touch. so many people just yeah. want Matt to be safe and happy. And so many wanna know, how are you coping with being the listening ear to all of these stories? Uh, because you're a special person to be able to be in that situation to help them. Thank you, um, it's heavy. Um, but I will gladly carry them. You know, I, I think that I, I'm just trying to be like Jesus. That's what I've been taught, and, and, and I'll do that any day. And so I hope if anyone's listening who is still struggling, please reach out to me or, or to other people that you know. I will, I will gladly listen. Um, How do they reach you? Supportive. Uh, they, they can reach me um, on any of my social media platforms. Uh, Instagram is uh, ITSMATTY27. It's Maddie27. Um, on Twitter, I'm Easton underscore Maddie. Um, I don't have any videos on TikTok, but it, my TikTok is Matt's Potatoes. Um, uh, so you're welcome. It's a play on mashed potatoes. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, reach reach out to me, please. Um, I, I I don't know if I can do a whole lot, but but I will listen. I want to. I was listening to the Radio West uh, interview. It had Kendall Wilcox and um, Taylor Petrie. Taylor Petrie. And then this wonderful female uh, of color queer student at BYU who's a sophomore. She runs 
BYUQ, which is an organization for queer students at BYU. And she told me the sad, she, she's sorry, I've never met her. And Kyle's looking up her name. I, I apologize. I don't remember her name. Check it out on Radio West if you can, so we can uh, give her proper credit. But she, okay, so just to back up a bit, right now I've had stud, I've had teachers in public schools here in Utah reach out to me and say they've had a, a rainbow flag up in their classrooms for a decade or more just as a way to kind of show support. But that just this year for the first time, and her name is... Maddie, go ahead. Maddie Hawes. Maddie Hawes. So shout out to Maddie Hawes. You did so great. Uh, your work is so great. And your work on your your comments on Radio West were really powerful to me, Maddie. But um, but I, I have I have teachers reaching out to me in K through twelve schools saying that just now in 2021 they're being asked to take down their rainbow flags because the, the they're told by administration that they're viewed as being political now. And so then I heard Maddie talk about how prior to Holland's talk, she had a website for BYUQ, and there's an Instagram page. I encourage people who are queer students at BYU to join this. She had a website. I don't even know the URL of the website. Maybe it's on that Radio West um, description as well, where she listed uh, LGBTQ safe faculty, right? BYUQ.org. BYUQ.org. Okay, so... She said that on BYUQ.org, she had a list of like 80 or 90 LGBTQ affirming faculty so that queer students at BYU could know who they could go to who would be safe. She said that after Holland's talk, she took down that page for fear of those professors being targeted now, not to mention now because of Holland's talk about parades and demonstrations um, are now... Is it now, are, are students going to be terrified to, to, to hold a, a rainbow umbrella, to wear rainbow colors, to wear a rainbow pin? Are faculty and staff going to be afraid to show a rainbow flag or a sticker? Uh, and, and this is going back to what you said about how, like, I can imagine you feeling like, what happened? I thought I was doing good. And now the whiplash is things, be eld, queer, be BYU students might even be worse off now, not because of you, but because of Holland's, what I would say, are irresponsible reactions. Is it now, are BYU professors running, fra a, a, are they running scared? Are they going to have their continuing status denied if they're too LGBTQ affirming? Are rainbows off limits? Are, are is showing a affirming support for LGBTQ students off limits? Uh, what does it mean to be too supportive of, of kids that literally want to end their lives? What does that now mean? Elder Holland, BYU, can you please, with your new office of whatever. Belonging. Belonging. Can you please make this really clear? Because the stakes now maybe are, are higher than ever. I don't even know if that was a question. but That was nine of them. So pick which one you'd like, because <laughs> then I have four more to follow up with. Oh, my gosh. Well, how? Um, no, yeah, I just I, I completely agree with what you're saying. And, and I think that it's it's disappointing. And I, I feel personally, I mean, I haven't been at BYU for two years, but but I didn't get that feeling on, on campus. I didn't get the feeling that having rainbow flags was an issue or that people are upset. I mean, I'm sure there's always going to be someone who, who has a dissenting opinion. But, but overall, I just couldn't help but think there's, there just feels like there's such a disconnect between, you know, the, these church leaders and these people who are dictating uh, BYU policy and what's actually happening on the ground and, and how people really feel and what we really want. And I think that's uh, that's the other part of the question that I am interested in. Last night, um, I saw that there was a experienced design professor that resigned his position at BYU, and and I think that brings up a, a valid conversation. If and he said directly as a result of uh, Elder Holland's speech, I've resigned my position at BYU because I do not stand for this political rhetoric or this. Um, the, the way we're harnessing uh, and not allowing the civil rights of our LGBTQ community uh, to be seen. And I think that brings up a valid conversation, and, and I am interested in what you have to say about this, Matt. Uh, being a former student of the university, by having 
an, an affirming ally who is faculty leave BYU? Is that, is that, does that provide a negative experience? Is, that, is there a negative ramification to him leaving or her leaving? Um, or in a show of solidarity, should more uh, BYU faculty and staff members pack up and do what is right and let the consequences follow? Your perspective? It's it's tough. I, I think it can be a little bit of both. I mean, I, I know personally, I, I don't think it's as easy for professors to just pick up and, you know, leave their tenure and, and leave, you know, their, their because also like opportunities in academia are not easy to come by. It's not like there are just jobs readily available. Well, let's and, face it, BYU is not super always highly respected academically nowadays. Right. 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 So, so I see that there can be some conflict there. Um, and also... I, I really believe that queer kids are gonna keep coming to BYU. I mean, it's just gonna happen. Like kids it's a like fifth me, of the campus. Yes, a fifth. Of, I mean, it's not gonna stop. And and so if if all the professors who are able to help leave, does that just make it worse for these queer students who are inevitably going to be there? You know, I don't know. Um, I do have to say, um, I had a uh, one of my mentors uh, at BYU, a professor I'm very close with, who I've worked with. Um, they actually left BYU as well. Not recently they, they left maybe about a year or two ago um but in personal conversation they said one of the deciding factors was because they felt like they couldn't be at a university um with such discriminatory discriminatory policies against lgbtq people and and i talked with them on the phone this week you know i called them immediately and and they said i'm so grateful i'm not a pro i'm not a professor there right now uh because this would just the the dis the cognitive dissonance would be too great you know and, and, and I've had a lot of my professors and a lot of my mentors in several departments reach out to me personally this week in support. Um, some of them banded together. They they donated five hundred dollars for me to go to to get therapy, set up a recurring. I mean, they really their hearts are in the right place. They love us as students and they want us to succeed, um, regardless of what our status is in the church. And and I feel that you know, and I hope that other students feel that as well. Um, so so I think that. These poor professors are, are caught in a really hard place where, you know, it's their morality versus, you know, their their livelihood. It's it's a catch twenty two in some ways. I, I don't know. I guess I just feel for them. I don't know what I would do if I were them. I think at the end of the day, it really is do what is right. Let the consequence follow. And if if we've learned anything from Mormonism, Mormonism, it is. I mean, the the, the polarization that surrounds this topic comes because people are heeding to their personal revelation as opposed to policy or doctrine in a manual. And I think that's super important. So to that professor who resigned and to others who will likely follow in that um, procession, uh, I say my hat is off and thank you for doing what is right. And to others, I, I hope that you understand that consequences will follow, whether that be for the better or for the worse, whether it is forced free agency or not, where some of those professors are dismissed because of their allyship or they're able to still wave a banner at BYU. Either way, I, I, I agree with you. I want to see um, in or out of the church a student uh, or someone adjacent to BYU happy and thriving. I'll just add John Larson on Mormon Stories earlier this week shared his perspective, which is how he felt like you can't really be an ethical person and, and stay a BYU faculty member be, because of the homophobia there. I respect John a lot. I respect that position. Isn't it also fair to give a shout out to the BYU professors who maybe at their own sacrifice or cost decide to stay at BYU to be that safe haven or to be that affirming voice either publicly or privately for LGBT kids who feel like they don't have any support. And we know they need it. I mean, that shout out to them too. Like maybe there's honor in both paths. Maybe there's no one right path. Maybe, I don't know, I, I don't wanna speak out of turn. The old affirmation, a few years ago, affirmations conference uh, title was uh, Many Paths, One Heart. Yeah. And I think that is applicable in this situation that there are many different paths to get to the end result, but the heart is in seeing people survive and thrive in that liv livability. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if for a second, could we talk about uh, kind of the timing of this speech? Yeah. I think personally for me, one of the things that really caught me off guard is why is this being brought up over two years after it happened? 
um, you know, if this really was such a big issue that I came out the way that I did and that BYU really shouldn't um, be supporting queer voices in this way, how come there wasn't, you know, a sharp reprimand? You know, the, the Doctrine and Covenants say reprove betimes with sharpness when moved upon the Holy Ghost. Um, why wait two years? And, and, and I'd love to hear what you think, but uh, my personal perspective, I can't help but feel a little bit tokenized. I feel like um, my story, my experience brought a lot of good press PR. to BYU. Yeah, yeah PR, sure. sort of saying like, oh, BYU, gay students can succeed there. There is a place for us. Um, queer students who are in high school who want to come to school, maybe BYU is all right after all. Um, and and then as soon as that PR is kind of over, as soon as, as the, the good they can glean from it is gone, then they say how they really feel, sort of that whiplash and it can't it also reminds me in 2020 of the honor code uh policy change where you know for three and a half weeks they let queer students think that it was now okay to date that as long as we kept the law of chastity we could kiss and and be on hold campus hands. hold hands yeah. and then and there was so much good press around that and awesome conversations and then as soon as that was over they said oh actually no um i i can't help but see the parallels and i can't help but feel tokenized and like it was disingenuous but but of course i know i have my own bias I, I i don't know i'm curious what both of you think well i think i mean back to our discussion about the the golden calf or the idolization i i think the church um has not only done a very good job at leveraging its real estate but also its political capital and uh, i am in the camp that believes that you um mormonism especially in this space likes a good weapon Mormonism likes a martyr, and they like a weapon. It's just high demand religions do that. You have to have a weapon to rally the troops and to feel persecuted and to feel like you're fighting for a cause. So you I have to have an enemy. I often you also have the, to have an enemy. The boogeyman effect, yeah. where they create Matt or others like Matt as a boogeyman. Uh, you can't you can't be this because there again will be no happiness, no spiritual experiences, no success on this side of the aisle. They always create something to fear. And so now, um, seeing that there was positive capital that's coming out of a story, immediately Holland has to create a boogeyman and has to create fear around this topic. And I, again, this is why I believe that you are used as the bludgeon, used as this sharp stick tool to prevent or to deflate those balloons that were rising in terms of acceptability. And this isn't the first time we've heard Holland say this. In 2019, uh, addressing the seminary and institute teachers, uh, he comes out and says, my biggest fear and one of the most uh, damning realities that we're seeing in Mormonism is that our Gen Z uh, population is becoming affirming. They're blurring the lines between friendship and condoning uh, in terms of the, the doctrine. And so he said, they all have LGBTQ friends, and that is a problem to Holland. And that's what he's telling the Seminary and Institute teachers is prepare for that and then find ways to combat that. So do we rip friendships apart at that point? Do we tell other Gen Zers that they're not allowed to have LGBTQ friends? This is now the Mormonism that we remember in the 50s, 60s, 70s. You can't play with that family because they're not members of the church. You cannot associate with that family because they have a gay son or a gay daughter or a transgender child. That is the polarization that is. So for a church that needs to combine and to bring its people together, why are we still creating? It's not It's not necessarily us that's creating the divisive language, but that, that very statement to two separate groups of educators uh, is creating division. Absolutely. Can I read one comment? Somebody just said, Maddie, you didn't even say anything against the LDS doctrine. All you said was that you were gay, yet they saw that as a threat. And do you want to say anything toward to the, the heteronormative view of the afterlife and like celestial marriage is by uh, labeling yourself as gay, I guess, at a church school, that that technically is a threat that they need to whack down. I don't know. Yeah, no, which is crazy because I can cite, you know, half a dozen articles, for example, Elder, Elder Ballard's talk where he says, um, you know, like just saying that you are gay is okay. You can be a gay member of the church, you know, like, like, I agree. What I said was not against any any policy or doctrine of the church, and and in fact, I specifically crafted my words to make sure that it that it was did not say anything that would go right. against it. Um, which is just really disheartening, you know. And, and I hope that people who who heard his speech and who heard mine um, are able to look at that and to see, you know, what is so divisive about my words that that Elder Holland thinks, you know, that it could destroy the the moral foundings of. Uh, a foundation of BYU. Yeah. I, I mean, I just, 
if you know if I ever get a chance to speak with him, I don't know if I will. I'd, I'd like him to. I'd like to say, please, can you point to the, to the divisiveness in in my speech, and and how saying I'm gay is divisive. I, I only see it as inclusive. Somebody else was saying in the comments that it sounded like a, a faithful believing um, Mormon was saying earlier in the comments about how um, that you co opted the 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 speech for your own agenda. You know this. This boogeyman of like the LGBTQ agenda. This is its own religion, its own, you know, social justice camp of warriors, you know. And so at a church school, you have one agenda and that's God's agenda. And if you bring in these other ideologies, you are, you know, just punching Jesus in the face. I don't know what they would say, but like, you know what I mean? Just that yeah. that that general tone of like, you had your agenda and it's clear as day. And how dare you use the pulpit that's paid for with, I don't know, again, Jesus money. I don't know. Just people being like, that was so not the time and the place for the gay agenda to be brought into our precious ear holes. <laughs> you know? I know. I'm sure you've heard that before. That's kind of, a f we've had quite a few um, active Mormons in the comments. I'm just trying to like, collect i'm doing it poorly but you know the you know the general backlash that right the, those kind of sentiments i mean everyone is entitled to their own opinion i don't if if that's how they feel i don't know how much i can change you but but um i mean it, i i got all approved you know the other true believing members of the church like the dean's office approved this they saw it was okay they've been co-opted by the gay agenda though <laughs> no <laughs> Again. well i mean you you think about that Maybe Holland was sending a rebuke to your dean's office yeah. and to and to President Worthen and just basically saying, "Hey, maybe BYU approved it, but I, as the apostle, don't and didn't and don't let this happen again." Right. And, and he's announcing that as he's bringing in this new consultant advisor who is over Pathways to kind of clean house. You get the sense that he's saying, "Well, maybe BYU approved it, but maybe that's part of the problem." And we talked about this in an earlier episode a couple of days ago, and I wonder if that is happening. And this is just purely speculation, but even I, w I believe it was Kevin Christensen, who was uh, the, the commissioner of church education that was involved in what you just talked about earlier with the revision of the uh, BYU Honor Code and coming out when there was the, the Kevin Utt and the uh, the battle between the commission's office, the CES office, that, that he's gone now too. So we have this whole— Purge shifting of seats on the Titanic. And again, Elder Holland is the one saying, I'm not, I will go to my grave upholding the sanctity of BYU. And all these other people are looking around saying, okay, we're going to take a lifeboat, perhaps. And again, it's speculation, but I do, I do see that with this new office of belonging, some of the previous positions that were filled during the November 2015 policy, the, re the rescission point in April of 2019, uh, perhaps, and we could even maybe look into the dean's office and structure the dean's office at the same time as your speech happened. I just wonder if, how many seats were rearranged and how many positions just miraculously came available um, and were filled by new people in, in new responsibilities that have now um, become beholden to that ideology from the top down. Kind of a scary thought. <laughs> sure it is. Yeah. But, but looking at it on paper, that's a reality. It's what's happening. That is absolutely what's what we're seeing a rearrangement of photos on the wall in terms of uh, new leaders that are responsible uh, directly to the chairman and, and the members of the board. Namely, Russell M. Nelson as chairman of the board, uh, first and second uh, chairs or vice chairs, Dallin H. Oaks and Henry B. Iring. So mm -hmm. that's that's what's happening. I'm just sticking by the idea, number one, that BYU students, B LGBTQ BYU students are not going to feel safe to come out and be authentic. They're going to be watching over their shoulder, wondering if some Desnat, you know, BYU student, conservative BYU student is going to be like harassing them or pouring water on their chalk drawing or like pulling down their flag if they, if they fly one or hazing them if they happen to wear a, a rainbow pin, like... I'm sad and worried about all LGBTQ BYU students. I'm also sad and worried about LGBTQ affirming BYU faculty that are now going to be wondering, what if I'm too supportive? What if I'm too affirming? What if I show a flag? What if I put up a rainbow sticker? What if I'm too kind? What does it mean to be too kind or affirming to a, a kid who's struggling? Um, uh, that, that's just a horrible environment. And I think it's irresponsible of Elder Holland in the church to just let that lie there. There needs to be really clear 
specific instruction. What, how loving are you allowed to be to LGBTQ BYU students? And at the end of the day, when all of this energy is spent looking over your shoulder and looking in your rear view mirror, worried about who is chasing you or coming after you, uh, the capital that is spent here and wasted is the education of these students who are supposed to go out and shine and do well and rise and shout. And that is inhibited by the energy being spent and wasted by people looking over their shoulder to determine whether or not they are being too kind, if they're throwing too many starfish back into the ocean, if they are doing the things that they personally feel convicted to do. It's sad because I think at the end of the day, it, it will be the students, both gay and straight, who suffer from a policy like this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's heavy. It's sad. Yeah. It, it's sad because I, I, I don't think that the, the problem that Elder Holland is, is identifying or, or that he feels, it's, it's not going to go away. I mean, just this week, I've had four BYU valedictorians who were valedictorian before me who said that they are part of the LGBTQ community. Mm. I've had one valedictorian since me who's told me that they're gay. Um, and there's going to be more in the future. You know, we're, we're never going to go away. <laughs> and, and it just, to me, I think by silencing our voices, by saying it's not okay, it's again bringing in that isolation. It's saying we want you to feel alone. We, we don't want you to see that there is a future for you or that there's a, 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 an alternative path or even a path that still aligns but, but is just modified a little bit. And that's just heartbreaking because I've been in the place where I feel isolated and, and nobody deserves to be in that situation. Nobody, no, me no matter if they're a member of the church or not. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just too bad that, that I feel like this is what what the leaders want to have happen at BYU. And I like that you said we've now, it's Sunday, so we've completed a three-hour block. So thank you for joining us. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Church. <laughs> what message of hope do you want to leave? Yeah, and that's what I was like. What does the future look like now? Um, what does the future look like for Matt? What does the future look like for other uh, BYU students? What does the future look like for that faculty and staff and, and Mormonism as a whole uh, and in general? Where do we look and, and uh, what does the Nostradamus tell us what the future looks like? <laughs> and what would you say to LGBTQ Mormons or LGBTQ BYU students when they might be feeling a little bit sad or scared right now? That whole thing. His question, yeah. mine. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I think to start to, to say to the current queer BYU students, I just want to say I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that this is going on, and I'm sorry that you're being used as, as fodder for a culture war in one that you didn't ask to be a part of, but that we're being thrown into. I, I want those students to know that, that we see them and that we love them, and that even if the worst thing that you think could happen, if you get kicked out of BYU, you're going to be okay, and there are people and places that will make sure that you will land on your feet. Um, you are our family. Uh, we are your family, and we're going to make sure that you're okay, and we won't stop fighting until you are. Um, I, I, I feel for them. I hope that they stay safe in the coming weeks and semesters and years um, and know that, that we don't blame them for staying at BYU. I know there's so many reasons. I understand what that feels like, and um, I just, I just want to hold space for them. I think um, as a community, even after this week, as tough as it's been, I am really hopeful. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, the messages I've gotten this week, um, a lot of them have come from very active members who are very supportive, who say, this is not the church that I belong to. This is not the Jesus that I worship. And I'm not going to stand for this. You know, I think that there is more solidarity than we realize and that we can feel and that, that maybe the church doesn't want us to think that it's there, but it is, whether they like it or not. And, and so many people are here to love us and to support us and that our future is bright. You know, BYU, it, it may be tough right now where you're at, but you're going to get out of there one way or the other, you know, and, and there, you're going to have a successful career and a successful life and, you, and you're going to find love. And um, I, I know that because I thought that I never was going to find it either, but, but I am, you know, I'm in the process. I think we all are. And so I'm hopeful. I think that things are, are going to change. I don't know if they're changing fast enough for me to feel like uh, it's worth my sacrifice to stick around. 
Um, but I, I recognize and validate people who, who do feel that way. And I'm grateful for the ones who are, who are fighting for us, especially those active members who are heterosexual, who, who, you know, maybe it would be easier for them not to listen or participate, but who are, you know, sticking out their necks for us. We, we see it and we feel it and, and we're grateful for it. And we need that. We need it. So there are, um, I think maybe just we should probably mention some of the things aside from what you're doing in this space as well. There are BYU <clears throat> organizations that are out there uh, actively helping um, and <clears throat> excuse me and trying to to push this mes message forward. And I know BYU Pride, which is another organization, will be having their back to school uh, Pride March coming up on uh, Saturday, Saturday the fourth. And I, I would highly encourage this audience and others uh, to support that happening in Provo uh, on Saturday, September fourth, beginning at three o'clock, uh, and then going to seven. I know a lot of uh, of organizations that are sponsoring and supporting that. This isn't the first little rally that they've had, uh, which is just kind of a fun time in the park. Um, BYUQ is another um, organization. Color the Campus is another organization that has uh, worked diligently to share a little rainbow love uh, to, uh, to the BYU campus. And I, and I think just speaking to what you just mentioned, Matt, there, this is going to be really difficult for Mormonism to hide the color. In a religion that has done such a good job at being black and white and very little in the gray margins. The burst of color that is happening on these campuses throughout a variety of these activities uh, is exactly what black and white needs. It, it is exactly what we talk about when we create a, an office of belonging uh, focused on the marginal, uh, helping the marginalization of people. There's nothing uh, that says, we're more marginalized than, than being just black or white. And, and I think the ability to share color is going to be super important <clears throat> for the longevity of, of a project like this and, and for the visibility of queer people throughout Mormonism and beyond. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I got, like, I love the message of hope. I got this sort of semi-disturbing message that there are actually conservative BYU students who are camping out around the Y at night so that if any students try and light up the Y again with rainbow colors, they'll be there to stop it. But I like, I don't think the rainbow is stoppable. And I know that, that no matter what forces try and stop the beautiful plethora of colors from emerging at BYU, they are destined to fail. I still have 2,000 more umbrellas. We're gonna color that campus. Rainbow umbrellas? Rainbow umbrellas. Yeah. I love it. And that was an initiative that we started because of the far right who said you need to shield yourself from the rainbow storm at BYU and, and, and uh, buy a BYU bookstore umbrella and show that level of solidarity, solidarity around campus. And, and so um, in true fashion, we showed some color and uh, ordered 2,000 rainbow umbrellas and, and the campus is becoming more colorful because of, of that initiative. And it's just a, just a minor opportunity to show the importance of being visible and, and showing that there are people out there, just as we mentioned earlier, that people like Matt do not need to feel alone or broken and that they need to know that their best days are ahead. And we can do that together. And Matt, you, you being who you are, giving the talk that you gave, and now speaking out, what an amazing series of courageous actions to inspire and give hope to all of us. Thank you so much. And be willing to like, it's no small deal to be at a sort of a Ivy league equivalent PhD program. You freaking flew on a plane here, uh, in a really stressful week. I'm sure to be able to tell your story. I just, we can't thank you enough no, for th all you are and all you've done. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And, and I'm so grateful uh, for this platform that you guys have given me to share my story and my experience. And, and even if it helps just one person, um, that's enough. That's worth it to me. So thank you so much for all the work that, that you three are doing. Uh, thank you to everyone who's listening. And um, uh, this isn't the end. It's, it's only the beginning. And, and I think we should know, like by no minor stretch, we've had a tremendous audience that has paid attention uh, awesome. to this 15, episode. At least 1,500. Between our two platforms, 1,500, 1,600 people. Constantly. Conti continuously. The whole stream. So shout out to them. Kara, in fact, um, you've got some... Uh, 
Just some yeah. shout outs. You've been monitoring this. Do you want to share a couple yeah. shout outs? Um, we've done quite a few live streams. This is the most super chats that we've received. What's a super and chat? A super chat is where somebody on YouTube can donate money to Mormon stories to keep this kind of content going. And I just want to encourage everyone listening that Matt's Venmo is Matt Easton 27. Yes. So <laughs> please throw him some money. And uh, so Soap and Clay donated $50 and said, Matt, thank you. Your voice helped countless LGBTQ youth struggling in the religion and some old guy and his musket fire can never take that away. Um, thank you for your courage from Jerem Thurston. Uh, Logan D. Beck gave $170. <laughs> uh, Laren Perry, uh, who's part of uh, EFT with uh, Jesse Funk said, I'm a proud apostate standing by my LGBTQ community. And, uh, I could, I could go on and on. There's probably at least, uh, two dozen different, different, um, just super chats that kind of come into my eyeballs, but, uh, an outrageous amount of support and love from the comments of people who want to thank you for just being brave enough to speak out in 2019. And then now um, taking all of these bullets, let's say. So, yeah, from me and um, all of these comments, yeah. Seriously, thank you, Matt, for coming out and speaking. Thank you so much. Thank you. So great. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's always sensitive to just talk about donations and support because, you know, well, we should mention some of the resources to BYU students who might feel like they're, you know, they, they don't have the support they need. In Circle House is one I want to make a shout out for. If there's any Absolutely. BYU student in Provo who feels like they need a safe place to go, my dear friends Stephanie Sorensen Larson and Jacob Dunford and the good folks at In Circle House, In Circle is a great uh, support. Any other support? resources we want to mention in the in the uh, show notes and i also think just in terms of uh mental health i think uh there are a handful of suicide hotlines not only for the lgbtq community the lgb community but also a transgender community as well uh, the trevor project is also a, a friend and fan uh, of our work with the latter gay stories podcast there is a community of people out there who are, are ready to support sometimes a distant phone number or a chat is similar to what matt talked about in a foreign country um, it is a great way to connect with someone because they don't know you. On the flip side of that, sometimes someone close to you who understands and, and intimately can uh, uh, have empathy for your situation is important to you. So I, I encourage you to find uh, resources. Affirmation is a, is a great online community. The Latter Gay Stories community uh, is super important, especially for parents uh, who find out that they have a gay child and, and they don't know where to turn. And, and sometimes when we lose uh, members of our community, it's because we lost a sense of community. We lose the, the inability to connect with other humans. And, and so I want to create a platform of connection. And as we talked about, BYU Pride, uh, Rainbow Con uh, the, the Rainbow Connection, um, the uh, USGA at BYU is super important for the monumental work that they're doing in the heart of the lion's den uh, in Circle as well there um, in the, the Provo location. So good resources. BYUQ. And I just want to do a shout out to just good old BYU CAPS, Counseling and Psychological Services. As far as I know, they're still a very safe, affirming place. They'll protect your anonymity and they're licensed psychologists with PhDs for the most part. And they'll give you the support you need if you're a BYU student needing support. Flourish Counseling and Therapy, uh, Symmetry Solutions, some of these um, these are professionals who understand, uh, who are members of this community as well, that can offer uh, immense levels of empathy and understanding as you navigate this journey. And we, we want you, we need you. We need you to know that you're not alone, that you're not broken, and that just as Matt shared in his story, your best days are ahead. We'll have all those links in the show notes. And for a church who loves spreading the gospel through storytelling, I think, Matt, this is just a beautiful story from the beginning of the way that you were raised and your dedication to the gospel, but coming to terms with your own sexuality, not fitting into this box that your family and culture has put you into and you growing from that and helping other people. This story, so many comments said, this will be a pivotal moment. This interview, this story, Holland's talk, this is going to be a groundbreaking interview and you're here making history right now. Yeah. And a beautiful comments of people uh, saying that they're going to tell their kids about this one day. So yeah. <laughs> this is a brave thing that, that you're able to step up and do this. And I know that you've 
like I said, took some bullets for this, but like the amount of response in the comments, I'm sure you'll go back and read and I'm sure people will DM you <laughs> every day until you die one day, <laughs> until you're an <laughs> old man doing laps in a swimming pool, you'll be reading messages about the time that you gave that speech as Val Victorian in 2019. So. And told your story. And told your story here, man. Well, thank you, Matt. It's going to have such wide, beautiful ripple effects. I hope so. Thank you so much. And we All didn't right. bite. <laughs> and you didn't bite. That's right. All right. Well, Kyle, dude, thanks for uh, joining me. I, I just, it wouldn't be complete without you here. So thank you. Thanks, Ying. Yeah. Does that make me Yang? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thanks for Ladder Gay Stories podcast. It's a huge, important part of our community. So I hope so. Up. Yeah. And, and I hope just, uh, just to give people an opportunity to be exactly who they were created to be. And n no shame, no fear, but just an honest, a look at the beautiful people, and unfortunately, some of those beautiful people that Mormonism is losing, uh, that are, as was said earlier, uh, members of this chorus and choir, and we need you. We, we need all those voices. Yeah, we need you. Don't give up. It gets better. It does. And Latter Gay Stories can be found where? Uh, online, LatterGayStories.org. We're on all the platforms as well. Um, our video and audio episodes are available everywhere you catch your audio podcast. Video video uh, episodes are available. Um, on our website, uh, our YouTube channel, and uh, our Facebook page. And if you want to help out our many ventures as well, at Latter Gay Stories is our Venmo. And our monthly donors can subscribe on our website, uh, LatterGayStories.org, and click uh, the Donate tab at the bottom of the page. And we would happily put your money to good use in a variety of different opportunities. I know you don't do it for the money. Cause... No, no, <laughs> I don't. And But you need money to do it. I mean, that's how it works. It allows us to build bigger and stronger bridges. The Rainbow Umbrella Initiative came because of donations um, from our community. And we have a variety of, we have an outreach program as well where we're taking this message to small communities, um, the the Vernons, the Richfields, the Fairview, these small communities that don't have a queer presence. Those are things that we do with your donations to be able to bring a sense of community to Salt Lake, Provo. These areas have a large population of LGBTQ people, but think about the small cities where you're the only one or two or three or the parents of those gay children. That's what we use donations for is to help reach those families. And I think that's a vital and important work, especially with our, our queer siblings and, and family members. Yeah. Those are some great resources. Can you mention Mama Dragons as well? Oh, yeah. I know my page is like, <laughs> you didn't see anything about Mama Dragons. Yeah, mine Absolutely. Is too. Mama Dragons as well, uh, who um, invented the great um, warm hug for the LGBTQ people. And, and I have been a recipient of those hugs. And those Mama Dragons um, tirelessly work. They fight as dragons. And there's, uh, there's a, a father, a dad, dad dragon, I think they call it. Dragon Dads. Dragon Dads, yeah. yeah. Drew Armstrong Strong would kill me if I didn't mention mm -hmm. that. But uh, both for mothers and fathers uh, who are finding themselves in these experiences, not only as a support tool, I, I would mention that Mama Dragons just released a new program called Parachute that is out there to help parents uh, find a soft landing as their children come out and give them the tools and resources that are necessary uh, to help them th survive and thrive. I think if I could also uh, just mention one other foundation uh, I'm actually a part of. It's called the Out Foundation. Uh, it's put together by queer alumni from BYU, and it's specifically for current LGBTQ students at BYU. Um, they have emergency funds in case uh, you're kicked out of school or you need to suddenly um, get a new roommate or something. They also have resources if you want to transfer schools, and they offer scholarships uh, for current LGBTQ nice. students. That's so great. Oh. Definitely BYU students, reach out to the Out Foundation, and um, they'll, they'll be able it. to help you out. Love it. All right. Well, last but not least, Kara, uh, thank you so much for being here on a Sunday. You, you do the time codes, Pleasure. you provide wisdom, you monitor the chats, mm -hmm. you make sure our audio sounds good. You're helping us up our game and, um, and you're fun to have around too, to boot. Thank you so much for coming. No sweat. Like it's an honor. So excited. So yeah. thanks. All right. Well, I think that's it. Anything Oof. else you want to say, Matt? You good? I'm good. Thank okay. you so much. Let's go have let's go have dinner if you guys are able. If not, that's okay too. But on I'll a just, Sunday? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Especially on a Sunday. Taco um, Bell is open. <laughs> thanks to all you listeners. We had an amazing group. Uh so thanks to everyone who watched or listened now or in the future. Thanks to everyone who chatted or commented or asked questions. Thanks to everyone who donates to make uh Mormon Stories podcast and the Open Stories Foundation possible. 
Uh, we'll keep doing this for as long as we get your support. But most importantly, Matt, thanks to you for making the sacrifice to come here. And thanks to those who paid for your flight, frankly, yes. and your expenses to make it possible. But we just so look up to you. So many other people do. And uh, thanks to you, Matt, most of all. Thank you so much. All right. All right, everyone. We'll, uh, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming up on Mormon Stories Podcast in the weeks, months, and years ahead. So please stay tuned. Please share this with everyone you can. Please put this on all your social medias, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Make, make short videos of it. Spread Matt's love. Spread his story wherever you can. If you know any LGBTQ BYU students, please send this to them to let them know there's hope. Please share it with friends and family. And, uh, you know, we just appreciate all your feedback and support. Email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. If you have feedback, comment at mormonstories.org or on the YouTube channel. Um, if you've got any uh, feedback or comments, follow us on all the different platforms, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube, because that helps us in the algorithms and just uh, keep supporting us. And as long as you do, we'll provide you with more content. You guys take care. Have a great Sabbath. Um, be good to each other, love each other, and we'll see you guys all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast and Latter Gay Stories. And most importantly, it's, it's stories like Matt's and yours that help us to continue writing our Latter Gay Stories. All right. Take care, everybody. See ya.